Hello. Good morning. How you doing? Hey, uh, Adam. Uh, are you from the Maryland? Uh, yes. Okay. Great. So you will be the one. Okay. Hey, one question I had is that uh, there is a slide that they wanted to display between the sessions. So that is something that you will be doing or what's the not that i'm aware of that's the first i've heard of it i don't okay. have any slides but you certainly can i so i promoted you as to a panelist okay let's... i can actually make you a co-host as well but as of now you can share your screen and show whatever you'd like okay so, so down i'm not sure if you're familiar with zoom or not but down bottom, I have uh, where where is the share? Okay, share my screen. Let us see. Uh, share screen. Okay, is this? There we go. Yep, I see it. Okay, so that's fine. Stop share. So I just promoted uh, Fatima, who is the student helper. Are you? Can you hear us, Fatima? Yes. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Fine. Thank you. I'm not sure if um, Dr. Barris had anything in particular for you to do. I've obviously promoted you to a panelist. I'm going to yes. go ahead and make you a co well. Okay. Um, did he go over how you permit people, uh, promote um, people? Or uh, I actually attended the webinar we had uh, on Friday. So oh, okay. Okay. So you're, you're aware yes. of what to do. Then. Yes. Yes. Okay. So will you be promoting the people from the attendees list um, that are on the the list to panelists? Okay. You, you can do that or did you want me yes. to take care of that? Um, okay. Wait a minute. Are you talking about the people who will be presenting or the one who has questions? Uh, the people that are presenting. Uh, I can take care of that. Okay. Now, as far as the questions go, I, he the way he's they've been doing it all week is um, <clears throat> they've been using the chat function. Yes. Yes. I have attended a couple of um, sessions. I know almost what is going on. Okay. Great. Great. Yes. I'll still stick around um, for you know technical support if you need anything. Okay. Uh, if I do have to step away, I will chat with you directly, like a okay. uh, private chat. Okay. And just to let you know, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and I'll put my cell number in here now in case for some reason there's an issue and I'm not down here uh, immediately available. You can just text or call and okay. I will be, be right, you know, come right back down. Okay, great. I have your phone number. Great. Okay. So if you just open up the attendee, the participants window. Yes, and, I can see it. And yep, keeping an eye on the attendees there and, and I'll do the same. Okay. But I'll, I'll allow you to go ahead and promote them. If I notice that you, you, you don't see, so, if someone's not promoted or something, I'll go ahead and do it. So, you know, between the two of us, we'll make sure everybody gets to where they need to be. Yeah, great. I can already okay. see the list of attendees and the more options and the promote to panelist option. Correct. You don't see that? Yes, I can see that. Oh, okay, great. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. That's it. Okay. Yeah, okay. and if there's if you need anything, just again, you can chat with me or, you know, um, even just speak up. I'm going to be here for the a majority of it, but I may have to step away for a minute or two here and there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll be here. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Hi, Fatima. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, my. I'm sorry for speaking. Uh, so I had a question that between the sessions, there is a slide that needs to be displayed. Yes, I have that slide. Okay, great. So you can take care of that. Yes. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. You're welcome.
pay homage. Hi, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, sounds good. Let me
Good morning, Professor Barris. Hi, Adam. Everything is okay? Yeah, so far so good. Do you have all the speakers? Good morning. Yes, sir. Yes, John, I got them. And then I spoke with uh, Fatima and she is ready to help out as well. But we, I've got everyone listed and, and we're in good shape. Very good, thank you. Mm Adam, I don't see all the speakers. You have Hamid, but I don't, I don't see Pan Union. Right, they're, they're, they haven't arrived yet. <laughs> I see, and then you don't see the, the other person, uh, Guan Zhepeng, he's a student from NYU. Yeah. Right, I don't see him. I, we're make, look like we're missing Stefan, Guan Zhen, Guanez, and Yun, Union. Right, 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 right. So I'm going to send them an email. So Stefan, uh, Kwanian said that Stefan is going to log in like half an hour before his talk. <laughs> here, he's here now. I'm going to promote him. He just showed up. Okay. Okay, fine. Good. So it looks like just two more for the morning. Yeah, yeah, session. yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone. Sorry for coming in late. I was mistakenly with the with the time difference, so I'm yeah. I figured that's, that I can make it on time perfectly. That's what that's, I always worry about. That. I don't know. That 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 works. <laughs> Yesterday I had to email a person because he thought it was Pacific time, so I just caught him just in time. Okay, let's see. Surab, so, anytime you want to start, you can start. Uh, it's 10.29, give it another minute and then start. Okay, so and good. then every, uh, every, make sure everybody talks about 20 minutes, four plus four, maybe four or five minutes for questions because time is tight. Okay, thank you. And good morning thank to everybody. Thank, thank, thanks a lot, John. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, so I think we have most of the speakers. Let's see, uh, Hamid is here. Uh, is the speaker of the second paper here, Union Pan? No, I guess he's not here. The, uh, I just promoted them. They should be. They should show up any second. In the yeah, yeah. Union is here. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's here. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Stefan is also here. Guangzi uh, Peng. That's the fourth paper. So right. that's Peter, I see. So I think except for the fourth paper, I think uh, I see everybody here. So I think we can get started and let's see what uh, probably they will show up in time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, John, you were saying something? No, 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 go ahead. Yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning session on the fourth day of this conference. And uh, today, this session is about theoretical foundations of security games. So we have five interesting talks and uh, hopefully the speakers can keep their time limit. So each speaker gets 20 minutes to talk. They should stop immediately after 20 and you have two to three minutes of question answer session. 
and uh, that will also give the time for the next speaker to come in and put his slides on. So without uh, any further delay, uh, let me introduce the first speaker. It's Hamid Dimagi from Iowa State University. So Hamid, please go on. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hamid Emadi. Uh, I'm PhD student in Vector Bhattacharya's group at Iowa State University. And today I'm going to talk on the characterization of saddle point equilibrium for security games uh, with additive utility. Uh, essentially, a cyber physical system is an engineered system uh, in which a physical system or a process is augmented with a cyber uh, component such as computational hardware or communication uh, network. As a result of this integration, these cyber physical systems are smart, capable, and um, efficient. Uh, examples of cyber physical systems are power grids, cars, uh, and uh, intelligent transportation systems. Uh, any cyber physical system should be stable, reliable, uh, and resilient and secure. In this work, uh, we focus on security of a cyber physical system. Uh, when we introduce cyber layer to the system, it leads to additional uh, vulnerabilities in the system. Uh, for example, it increases access points uh, to the cyber physical system uh, and using the, the uh, standard communication uh, protocols from one side can be, uh, can be considered as the, mm, advantage of the system. And on the other side, it can be considered as the weakness of the cyber physical system because of the cyber threats, potential cyber threats. As a result, uh, multiple types of attacks are possible. Like one can modify the sensor uh, uh, readings or modify packets in communication network or introduce malicious software code into the system. There have been many uh, cyber attacks in the last decade. Uh, for example, uh, uh, a cyber attack to Iran centrifuge in 2010. Another example with severe impact is a cyber attack to Ukraine power grids in 2015, uh, which led to a huge blackout. Uh, and recently there have been a number of reports regarding cyber attacks uh, to power plants of the United States. Uh, one of the important problems uh, in security of network system is how to efficiently allocate lim limited uh, resources to protect targets against potential threats. And uh, with the development of computational game theory, such resource uh, allocation problems can be cast in the game theoretic context, which provide uh, defense uh, strategies that cannot be exploited from the attacker. And uh, moreover, game theory is a mathematical tool which takes into account the parameters of the system quantitatively. And this leads to the, to the development of the network uh, design and risk assessment. A number of applications can be mentioned for this problem. Uh, for example, it can be used for randomized allocation of checkpoints at important places like air, airports, and it has been used in uh, Los Angeles airports. Moreover, it can be helpful uh, for minimizing the impact of malicious attacks on uh, network systems like power grids, computer network, or vehicular uh, networks. Uh, here is the outline of the rest of my presentation. First, I will present the problem formulation and solution concept. Next, I will present the most relevant works and I will talk about uh, structural uh, properties of the optimal solutions from attacker's perspective. And next, I will present the dual problem and I will talk about the defender's optimal strategies and structural properties uh, of the solution. And finally, I will sum up with the summary and uh, future works. Uh, here, we formulate our problem in the following way. Uh, we consider a two-player uh, zero-sum game between an attacker and a defender. We consider a set of uh, M uh, targets. It can be uh, M links in a network as a target set and it is denoted by I. And we assume that the attacker and defender has uh, resource constraints of Ka and Kd and it has to be less than M. Uh, therefore, action sets of the attacker is all M choose Kd combinations of uh, choosing Ka links out of M links. And in the similar way, the action sets for the defender is M choose KD 
combinations of picking uh, KD links uh, out of M targets or links. So we denote the action sets by an A and N D for the attacker and the defender. Uh, for example, here with 15 targets and by considering uh, three resources for the attacker and four resources for the defender, we have 455 uh, possibilities for the attacker and uh, 1,365 possibilities for the defender. So, and uh, we associate a cost phi i uh, to each target i. And consequently, we can uh, construct a payoff matrix for the attacker and the defender. And since we consider a zero sum game, the cost is for the, the payoff for the defender would be negative of the payoff for the attacker. The ij element of matrix A, which is the payoff to the attacker, is defined as a summation of impacts for targets which are attacked or, and not protected. So in this formulation, uh, additive property holds. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, the impact of a group of uh, failure of a group of targets is equal to the summation of the impact of those individual uh, impact of those individual targets. And since we consider a zero sum game again, the payoff to the defender would be negative uh, a. Uh, in game theory, players can randomize over action sets and they are not confined to select uh, pure actions. Uh, so we define P and Q as mixed strategies of the attacker and the defender in probability space. And we define feasible space of P and Q as DP and DQ. And uh, the, expected, the expected utility function when attacker takes P and defender takes Q is uh, P transpose AQ, and it is denoted by V. And we denote the saddle point strategy by a star, uh, P star and Q star uh, for the attacker and the defender. And we know that the saddle point uh, strategy has to satisfy a specific inequality. And this equality physically means the, any unilateral deviation from the saddle point strategy uh, will not lead to better outcome for the players. Uh, there are notions of security levels in uh, game theory, which is defined as guarantee levels for the players, regardless of the other uh, player's action. And uh, here, uh, the security level for the attacker is max min of P transpose AQ, and for the defender, it is min max uh, problem. And according to the min max theorem, uh, in two player zero sum game, security, security levels uh, are equal and they are equal to the value of the game. Uh, in general, uh, any two player zero sum game can be formulated as a linear programming and any linear programming can be solved in polynomial time in terms of the variables of the problem. Uh, we can formulate a zero sum security game as an LP. However, uh, this problem has uh, NA variables and ND constraints, which are exponential in terms of the number of targets. Uh, and consequently, it makes this problem uh, intractable. So in this uh, plot, uh, these blue dots show the number of uh, targets and the number of resources for which a regular LP solver reaches to the solution. Um, as you see here, solver leads to the solution only for uh, one or two uh, resources. And for more than that, it is not feasible. Uh, it, it, is not, it cannot reach to the solution. Therefore, here the scalability is an issue in this problem. So in this work, we try to reduce the computational complexity by leveraging structural properties of the problem. Here I gave, uh, I, uh, I have provided the most relevant works uh, with our work. There has been many researches on uh, security games with single resource. Uh, 
uh, they consider different aspects aspects of this problem. For example, they consider uh, Nash equilibrium, Stack-Hilbert equilibrium, uh, and uh, moreover, they consider uncertainty in their formulation. However, the main challenge in uh, resource allocation in security games is considering multiple resources. And the most relevant work with our work is uh, Korzyk's paper uh, in which they provide a polynomial time algorithm for computing uh, Nash equilibrium for a security game. Uh, and they proposed uh, an iterative algorithm in a square time uh, in their paper. So uh, in this part, I will present the structural properties of the attackers uh, a strategy and uh, the original problem is max mean of p transpose a and we define a new variable here we define a new variable alpha i as attack probability of target i at, and it can be interpreted as a summation of uh, pi's corresponding to actions for which target i lies in uh, that set by substituting uh, this new variable uh, alpha into the original problem, uh, VSTAR star can be written as max mean of summation of alpha L phi L. And this formulation uh, is equivalent to the problem of maximizing the M minus KD uh, smallest alpha L phi L over domain of uh, feasible uh, alpha. So, uh, and uh, there is another paper which shows that this problem can be solved in linear time. That's why we uh, try to reach to a linear time algorithm for zero sum security uh, game. Uh, but before proceeding to, uh, to the structural properties of the solution, uh, we have to show that by these uh, changing variables, uh, for any feasible alpha, there exists a feasible uh, P. So we introduce a matrix M, which is called combinatorial matrix with M rows and N A columns. M is a, actually a concatenation of all Boolean's uh, vectors of dimension M with K A entries equal to one. And here, as you see, there is an example of a combinatorial matrix of M equal to four and uh, K a equal to two. So the relation between alpha and p uh, can be uh, written as m p is equal to alpha. And we prove that this mapping from uh, p to alpha is surjective, or uh, in other words, for any alpha, there exists a feasible p. So the proof of the surjectivity is uh, based on the nested property of a combinatorial, uh, this uh, combinatorial matrix. Uh, so uh, we proved that the saddle point strategy for the attacker should uh, satisfy a specific property. And that is uh, alpha i star phi i times phi i is a non-decreasing function of uh, phi i. In other words, if we label all targets uh, such that phi i's are in ascending order, then sequence of alpha i star phi i also is in ascending order. In order to prove this property, we show that for any other ordering of this sequence, there exists a feasible direction in tangent space of the value function for which uh, if alpha is perturbed, then V star is decreasing, which is contradiction with the optimality condition. Uh, considering this property, we are able to convert the original problem uh, with a high uh, number of variables into a new uh, linear programming problem with just M variables and M constraint. So we converted a problem with uh, m choose k a uh, constraint uh, variables and constraints to another lp problem with just m variables and m constraints uh, 
So um, here we introduce two uh, variables S and R and we show further properties for the optimal solution. We showed that the sequence of uh, alpha i star phi i has three parts. First part here is the equality and second part is the inequality and third part is zero. Moreover, here we define active sets as UA and UD for attacker and the defender um, respectively. These sets are defined as target sets with non-zero attack and defense probability. We show that active sets are functions of S star and R star. In other words, both players are randomizing over the targets with uh, highest impacts. In order to compute S star and R star, uh, and consequently the saddle point solution, we propose a systematic way to examine all possible cases for different values of S and R. We introduce an upper triangular matrix U and we associate each entry of U to possible uh, pair of S and R. We show that U can be constructed from two disjoint matrix U1, U2, and we provide closed form expression for the values of entries of all and all uh, feasible uh, conditions for each uh, entry of this matrix. Uh, since we are analyzing the problem from attacker's perspective, so the value uh, or the optimal solution would be the maximum non-zero or feasible entry of this matrix, matrix U. And as you see, the construct, constructing the, this matrix is uh, in a square time, uh, it is computationally in a square time. So matrix U uh, has uh, more properties. Matrix U is a sparse upper triangular matrix. And we use this uh, property in accordance with two more properties. Uh, and we show that computing the optimal solution uh, is linear in time. We showed that matrix U has at most one feasible entry in each column and matrix uh, U2 has uh, at most one feasible entry in each row. Moreover, if uh, an entry is not feasible, then either all entries on the right-hand side or all uh, entries below are infeasible. Uh, these properties provide a direction for searching for the feasible entries uh, in matrix U1 and U2, which leads into a linear time algorithm. Uh, here is the dual problem for the defender's perspective. The, uh, again, the, the original problem uh, can be converted to another problem by defining a new variable uh, beta as exposure uh, probability of target i. And by substituting beta into the original problem, uh, this leads to another problem, which is equivalent to the minimizing the kd largest beta i uh, phi i. So here again, we propose a structural properties for the optimal solution. And similarly, we construct a matrix, uh, another matrix W, and we give the closed form solution for the entries of this matrix and all feasibility conditions. And uh, we prove that um, the sparsity of this matrix uh, leads to, again, a linear time algorithm for computing the optimal solution from different defenders uh, perspective. Here is the uh, simple example uh, with 10 targets and two resources for the attacker and three resources for the defender. Uh, and here is the um, uh, optimal solutions or uh, probability uh, attack and defense probabilities of each uh, link or each target. In this problem, I consider each link as a target. And here, as you see, matrix U and matrix W is a sparse matrix. And in linear time, we can solve this problem. In linear, in terms of the number of targets, uh, which is here, in, it is 10. So um, in this problem, we have started with the scalability issue in security games. Uh, in this plot, uh, blue dots show the area for which the regular LP solver can solve the security game. And we proposed a linear time algorithm uh, and our method, method covers the 
entire domain of this problem, which enables us to deal with a large number of targets uh, in security games. To sum up, uh, here we address a zero sum security game with the utility function having the uh, additive property. And we provide a linear time algorithm, which is the best uh, possible in terms of the computational complexity to compute the saddle point uh, strategy of the players and value of the game. And uh, we propose the structural properties of the saddle point strategy, which leads to a closed form expression for the value of the game. And as a future direction for this work, uh, we plan to analyze, uh, anal uh, analyze the um, non-zero sum security game and uh, we extend our prob problem to uh, dynamic uh, games, uh, security games with additive uh, utility. Thank you for listening to my uh, presentation. Any questions? Yeah, thanks, Samit. Uh, so uh, time for some questions. Okay, uh, is the second speaker present? Uh, Union. Yes, uh, yes I'm okay. here. Uh, Union, probably, if, if there are no questions, then probably we can just move to the second speaker. Thanks, Amit, again. Uh, so, Union, you can start sharing your screen and we can get started. Okay. So, uh, the second speaker is Union Pan. He's from NYU. And, Union, you can get started. Okay. Um, uh, am I heard? Am I heard clearly? Clearly? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um. So, um, it's a great pleasure to be here to present this joint work with. Um, um, with, Dr. with Dr. Guanzo and um, Professor Jane Tao and, and one and my advisor, my advisor. So um, this idea is is origin originally comes from Jane Tao and and uh, thanks to other co-authors, we we managed to um, find the analysis. So um, before the presentation, um, I would like to. Um, uh, say a few words. So we begin with a simple question over um, the um, horizon um, game theoretic models along all along with all such kind of um, applicational applicational problems. So the problems, how are they determined? Um, it couldn't be kind of come out of nowhere, right? So um, a possible answer for that is it is possibly to determine this utility functions. Uh, the action space, strategy space, um, using some, some sort of inverse problem solution. So um, from the directly from the outcome of the strategic interactions of the players, we're, we might be able to um, determine <clears throat> um, the utility, utility functions inversely. So, um, but um, just to do a little bit of clarification that we're not trying to solve an inverse problem here. So uh, actually in this work, we, we didn't pay much attention to, uh, to how the players play. In other words, we, we don't pay attention to the, to the strategy. Uh, we're just leveraging the strategy, the equilibrium strategy is sort of the uh, useful tool to our problem. So, um, So the motivation of our work is um, um, it's unavoidable for us in cyberspace to reason some uncertainty. Um, let's suppose, some, um, for example, suppose you're a manager of the enterprise network system. It's it's very hard if, if it is not impossible for you to know every every detail of the individual computers, uh, every detail configurations. Um, uh, as well as the connectivity, and and suppose suppose there is some packet overflow overflowing problem, 
and it's hard to reason whether it is because of some applicational error or or it is because because some adversary try to gain the privilege of the system and as well as the um, intrusion detection system uh, because it is hard to interpret it in the alert there might be some adversary entering or it might be some false alert okay and uh, since we're modeling um, usually we remodel um, the situation as as zero sum games um, in a classical approach oh, before I forgot a classical approach for for this reasoning uncertainty is is to introduce some type vector which encodes some personal inform uh, private information of the players as well as the environment and that characterize their utility their, their payoffs uh, but in zero sum games it uh, doesn't matter um, we can we can turn the player's type into game into the game's type, which induces a sort of modal agnostic in zero sum game. And we need to estimate the game and forecasting game um, with some sufficient evidence, since we we're not um, uh, if we do, do not know nothing, then there, there's there's no possibility to estimate it. And let's look at this simple simple case study. Suppose Suppose you're a defender and you have a server group to protect and there's some attacker come out of the internet trying to uh, launch some attack, could be, could be jamming attack, could be some, some viruses, uh, malwares, etc. But for a defender, it's, it's impossible to know every configuration as we, as we have discussed. It's impossible to know the, uh, the details of the group, server group as well as the, the details of the adversary. So um, there must be some expert telling you that, oh, you, you, can, you can choose a subset of the, of the computers to protect, to install some, uh, some package software packages to, to against uh, this kind of attack. But how can we incorporate in this, this kind of experiences as well as the prior knowledge um, under, such uncertain, uh, under such uncertain cases? So um, since we're not talking about something in the air, um, there um, do exist some, some prior work um, that is related to game identification and, and, and estimation. So I think the pioneer, um, perhaps as, as to the best of knowledge, is Halt at uh, 1993. Um, they proposed a sort of, a sort of estimating uh, technique that is based on the, um, of the the choice frequency, which, which they call the conditional choice probabilities in order to estimate the dynamic, dynamic model. Uh, and following, followed by um, do, uh, Professor Pensendorfer in, in, in 2003 and 2008, uh, they proposed to um, estimators um, given some time series data that characterizing the equilibrium. And since, since they, um, the source to consider is from the time series data, which characterize some equilibrium, and there do exist some 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 set of the equilibrium instead of one point. So there are considerations of multiplicity in the equilibrium, and uh, uh, I think the earliest is uh, Jovanovic in 1989, who considered the multiplicity and following followed by which um, a you know, parametric estimation technique is. Is, is proposed to allow us to, 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 to allow um, multiple equilibrium selection process. And uh, these are for dynamic games. For normal form game, normal form game estimation, there are also some existing work. Uh, one example is, is the jury from uh, in 2004. And um, it, it sort of coincides with, with the recent empirical game theoretical analysis. Uh, which focus on uh, how I can I can query some data from some black box models, and um, by using this data, we're we're, we're able to um, characterize the the utility functions um, using some statistical bound. Um, but the problem the the problem for for this kind of work is is the first thing uh, is is in secured cases. Uh, the, the attack usually usually launched usually was launched in a, in a very drastic way. So um, the equilibrium data does not even exist. 
So the first question that we ask is, is whether this, this interaction data really, really um, characterize the equilibrium. And uh, the second thing um, is whether we, we do have the simulation um, black box models that is credible. Okay, and there there are some other um, challenges. The first one is is there there's some risk to data integrity uh, because of some human errors, machine error, translation errors, and, and or bugs, and or or some adversary try to manipulate your data, and and also there if if you're estimating the the utility function in some probabilistic range, then um, somehow this is some sometimes ter terrifying because. Uh, imagine uh, weather for, for, forecasting um, says that um, there is 5%, um, 50% probability that tomorrow is going to rain. Well, uh, sometimes uh, the, the variation, when the variance is very large, it's, it's, the risk is everywhere. Um, the same as imagine some nuclear power uh, plant manager tells you that, oh, um, there's some probability. Uh, Let's say ninety-five percent that our nuclear power wouldn't wouldn't explode. Well, that 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 was that would scare any people. Uh, that would scare many people. And um, most of the some of the estimation techniques are using are Bayesian based, uh, which means they have a have incorporated sort of the um, prior knowledge of the structural uncertainty of the, of the game parameters. But uh, sometimes it's very hard for for us to. To have a have a good belief, have a good prior belief of the game model, and it's, it is not it is not impossible. It, it, it is at least very hard. So when you shift the, the paradigm from from Bayesian based approach to to a sort of data driven approach, um, and the data must be um, expertise. So um, so instead of taking the route of uh, previous work in economic literatures. Uh, we propose another route uh, where we use a sort of a um, point estimation framework. So we consider a one shot game um, with some uncertain payoffs, but, but the distribution is unknown. So, and, and the game is possibly uh, repeatedly played in, in a very smaller time scale, but, but the, the payoffs is, is, is varying, is, is stage varying, which means every stage the payoffs will be generated by some random device. Okay. And uh, in order to avoid some some risk to um, data integrity, we assume that we have access to some expertise prediction and some hints of summarization of, of the uh, of the inter interactions. And all the defender needs to do is just it's just a weighting. It's just to learn the weighting of the recommendations of the expert. And this this is roughly this is roughly our our framework. Um, so what we provide is this architectures. So give them recommendations and experienced observations how to estimate security games with some noisy payoffs. So that's roughly. Um, so um, let's start with our uh, problem setting. So we consider some random zero sum game defined on some probability space and its fixed dimension repeatedly played possibly in some smaller time scale and um, distribution is unknown. And and before before the defender starts to play the game, uh, he is given some sort of uh, expert games um, that is um, that is we, we assuming we're assuming that uh, there is this some some expert trying to collect some information from this environment and given and give us um, the the prediction of the situation, and uh, after after the interaction outcome. Um, the 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 fall information of the AM is not reviewed. She instead observes some game value, uh, which is Z. This and Z equals to the value operator of this uh, of this AM, which is a random matrix. And the defender's goal is to uh, produce some game estimation. Um, this estimation is produced by some estimator. So um, a direct, a very natural, a never, very natural false that arise in is that we consider a class of uh, linear estimators, which is simply the, the linear combination of this expert games. Okay, so um, because at the end of the day, uh, the M, uh, the M1 and M2 from, from M1 and M2 to MS, uh, they're, they're essentially actually a vec in, a, in, a, in a vector field. So every, um, so the capability of the representation of any, of any, um, Kind of security games 
and zero sum gains are actually determined by this basis. If you if you view this um, expert game as some some sort of basis that are, that is random generated at, at every stage, and our goal is is after the play of the interactions, um, suppose that there are a, a reviewed uh, some sort of uh, value of the of the of the random matrix, um, or try to minimize the squared residue error of the estimation, which is just just to project our game matrix to the subspace spanned by this um, this matrix this uh, expert matrix, and our optimum at linear estimator is by um, is solved by uh, optimizing this this finite dimensional constraint problem. Um, oh, before I forget, um, I I must uh, introduce the, there are some some pre assumptions about expert games. So first of all, all Asper games have non-zero um, uh, set of point values, which means, um, uh, which is just for the com the 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 uh, the convenient the convenience of the proof, because we can always shift the metrics by some constant such that the value doesn't equal to, doesn't equal to zero. So um, that doesn't matter. And the second one is that we assume that every expert will suggest a different kinds of uh, matrix. Uh, which provides us with a sort of a linear independency. And um, the third is that um, we assume that entries of the expert gain matrices are founded. Um, you can see that this is these are just some sort of trivial uh, assumptions that doesn't matter. And um, as well as the true gain, the true gain matrix M and the true parameters must be bounded as well. So um, uh, I'll explain what, what, what do I mean by true parameters. Um, so let's first look at the, the, the game projection problem. So actually, if, if you only have one, if you only have one set of uh, expert games, uh, it's possibly the solutions are, are not uniquely de determined. Uh, so just imagine there can be multiple lines crossing one point. It's just the, the, the inclination rate is, is different. Uh, and we can some, consider some ratios um, as defined by uh, the z bar over value of the expert games. So at least we can find as as set of trivial solutions. But arguably, all these these solutions can be can be interpreted as completely trusting one expert and is not and is arguably arguably not good enough. So that requires some numerical solutions. And it's very natural for us to extend this um, this one step estimation to multiple step. So, um, in the dynamic estimation problem, uh, we're just we're just at, at every time stage, we're we're solving a uh, we're solving a, a nonlinear long nonlinear regression problem for this game matrix, and we assume that the correspondence between expert games and reviewed game value is time invariant, and. <clears throat> uh, which means this this equation holds. So for every time t prime, our, our value is equal to the value of the of the estimation plus some random noise. This uh, this random noise is assumed to be have zero um, zero expected value and has some uh, some some finite bounded variance. And central limit theorem tells us um, no matter what the distribution is, um, the epsilon is kind of goes to um, some some kind of asymptotic normality. So in that case, our, our alpha, in some sense, is asymptotically consistent, which means that alpha goes to alpha zero um, strongly with, with some probability one or with probability <laughs> by strong large number theorem. And um, just a few words for um, the relation to our framework uh, with uh, supervised learning. Um, if you think of, um, if you think of, if you think of one layer perception or, or just one layer neural network, um, we're just ex replacing every, every entry of the feature with some expert games, which is a matrix, which lives in some vector field. And we replace some sort of nonlinear activation function by linear programming. Uh, or this linear programming can be implemented by some other, other kind of techniques like lemma Hewson or other, um, but essentially they're finally a linear programming. Okay, so um, here we're gonna uh, present our main results. So first of all, um, because the, the remain the remain session will be um, we focus on the analysis of the of the um, uh, proposed the loss function. So the first thing is that we present 
and the the value the, the loss function is actually non-complex, but we we show we show some plots that that uh, exhibit this mm, this counterintuitive um, this counterintuitive lemma. So uh, this is for for one single step projection game projection, and this is for multiple. Um, and from the plot, they actually look like they are convex, but the, uh, but unfortunately they're not uh, analytically and and is provably. So um, that requires us to to find to to be satisfied. But, but the J alpha is, is actually a greater or equal than a greater or equal to zero. So that requires us to find some um, some algorithm algorithmic numerical solutions um, to this loss function. Okay, so, um, and uh, in order to use some first order to solve this, uh, first order methods to solve this problem, we have to, uh, we have to really dive into the perturbation theory of the, of this parameterized game matrix. And the first thing, uh, first assumption that what, that we want to introduce is that every game we try to estimate is, is completely mixed. Um, so what do I mean by completely mixed game? Uh, game matrix is said to be completely mixed if if every set of point strategy have no zero have no zero a, a component. So this actually makes sense because um, because the expert uh, doesn't need to report every every dominant strategy every dominant action. So um, if we if we um, so this is a highly abstract framework. So we doesn't have to we, we, don't, we don't have to consider uh, the actions that uh, that is that is dominated every every game that we're, we're trying to estimate is is completely mixed in in a sense that the strategy is randomized over all kinds of actions. Um, but this 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 assumption is actually very strange because because in order to make that assumption we have to restrict the uh, the parameter space. But um, uh, luckily we're able to we're able to using some experiment. To, to verify that this is actually conservative in the sense that um, if we want to solve solve the problem numerically, we don't have to we don't have we don't need it. Um, oh, actually, um, uh, in order to make this assumption, we have to uh, we have to assume that uh, the action space of the of the, of the, of the defender and ad adversary is actually is actually the same, which means this m must be square. But actually, in numerical Examples shows that um, the M could be could be non-square, could be uh, non-completely mixed. Okay, but this um, but this completely mixed uh, game um, property um, gave us some theoretical results that we can analyze. So the first thing that I want to introduce is is Shapley's basic results. Uh, suppose because we already have this assumption that uh, the estimated game is is completely mixed. So uh, we have any analytical solutions, any uh, close form solutions for this, va um, this value of the M as well as the set of point strategies of the M. And the M hat must have a singleton Nash equilibrium. So this, this, this singleton Nash equilibrium allows us to, to directly find out the, the gradient that, that enables us to, to directly uh, leverage some first order methods. Okay, hopefully I'm gonna finish in uh, very soon. So um, the main results uh, in our work is that we find this expert gain gradient. So I like this formula. This formula tells us that our gradient of the J alpha is equal to um, and the vector of partial contributions of the of the ex expert. So um, so delta i is equal to the the set of point strategy multiplying the expert matrix and because the expert matrix is actually bounded we can we can, we can um <clears throat> we can summarize that um that uh the vector of uh, the gradient vector is actually bounded and the second result is that we can actually find out the hessian we can dive into the hessian and and find out close form solutions for the hessian and we are we're able to prove that under some conditions, we are able to prove that this hashing is actually bounded. A direct result from this hashing is bounded is that um, our, our gradient is very smooth. And somehow um, the gradient of JT alpha is ellipsis continuous. So equipped with, with, this, with this result, we're able to leverage some, some first order 
some for first order methods, uh, since the uh, stationary point is satisfying. And, and because there, there's some error that is allowed, so we can characterize this um, uh, pseudo gradient appro approximation, which is just replacing every partial contribution as the mean value of the, of the expert matrix. And uh, numerical experiment shows that uh, the pseudo gradient approximation actually allows us to, to, analytical, uh, to, to numerically solve this problem. And it's more computational and more efficient because we don't have to we don't have to compute the Nash equilibrium strategy of every of every estimated gain. And because it's, this is a standard uh, nonlinear square, uh, this square of nonlinear estimation problem, we're able to use some Gauss, Gauss Newton methods to solve this problem. And this Gauss Newton methods is just a linearizing around every every point at every iteration and try to get an analytical form solution form of this quadratic problem. And um, so equipped with um, previous results, we we're able to prove that if this incremental expert gradient uh, algorithm is actually uh, give us a, a convergence result, as well as the, as well as the incremental Gauss-Newton methods, which is um, directly linearizing and minimizing the, the partial sum at, a, at every time step. And this is called an extended common filter. And, um, just to verifying a set of conditions um, such as just continuity and the, and the assumptions of the parameters such as the linear rate, learning rate, we're able to prove that this extended common filter actually gave us some extensionary point and it's very computationally very um, very computationally efficient. So let's go back to the previous example that we have mentioned um, uh, at the beginning. So uh, suppose you're the defender. Now you're defending this, this enterprise network. So you have a database which serves as some expert gives you some prediction of the of the matrix gain, as well as some uh, interaction outcome. And this interaction outcome can be interpret, interpreted as sort of the hindsight uh, optimal uh, set of point value that you can achieve. And by incorporating these observations, the defender are trying to uh, estimate the gain, which is a <clears throat> which is a matrix. And is and is and is a response matrix um, in the face of this uncertain variable. And uh, here's the results for for the convergence. Um, the above is the one step gain projection, which is very um, which is very steep because because the um, because the because you only have one um, one point to one distance to to minimize. And the second is the descent, a descent of objective um, J alpha. Uh, the, the multiple. The, the second is the multiple um, estimation problems and a learning curve, and we are able to show that convergence of the parameter. So, um, so a brief summary is that we established this game estimation framework, framework, and we're able to. Uh, analyze the objective function under some uh, very stringent but also very conservative conservative uh, assumptions, and we develop the algorithm. And a uh, future direction might be uh, might be that this completely mixed assumption can be somehow omitted or can be somehow analyzed why we don't need this assumption. And also, uh, this framework enables the extension to to some reformulating. Of course, you can you can you can add some constraint. You can you can uh, on the, on the parameter space, or you can add some um, other other conditions to, to on the on the expert, uh, or or you can directly extend it to um, dynamic gain because in stochastic gain, um, it is it is actually equivalent to finding to finding a Q matrix. <clears throat> That represent the state action value. Um, so uh, that's it, and I think I finished. So, so thanks thank a lot, Yunian, for the nice presentation. Uh, actually, in the interest of time, uh, uh, I think we'll move to the next speaker, uh, if that's okay. And any questions if you have, you can uh, get in touch with Yunian directly. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks a lot again. So, uh, I think, uh, could the next speaker please uh, come up? I think it's Peter. So, the next speaker is Peter Tomasek, and 
He is from uh, Czech Technical University in Prague. Okay, so I, I hope that you can hear me and see my slides as well. Yes, we can uh, definitely see your slides uh, and not, we also we can hear you. It's slightly as if you are distant from the mic. That's it. Or... Okay, it's better? Yeah, it's better. Uh, okay, yeah, fine. Awesome. So, hello everyone. My name is Petr Tomasek and I'm a PhD student at Czech Technical University in Prague. And today I would like to present you our work on solving zero-sum security games with sequential attacks using one-sided partially observable stochastic games. But first thing first, why should we even consider the, zero, the security games with sequential attacks? Well, currently mostly used model for solving security games are the Stackelberg security games, which were successfully applied to many real-world applications, like deploying air marshals to flights, or protecting the wildlife and endangered animals. And this model assumes only one-shot attacks, which means there is only one attack during the whole game, being either attack on one target or multiple targets simultaneously. However, in reverse scenarios, it's common that attacks on important targets are carried out by the attacker in sequential manner. And actually, the attackers can exploit the sequential nature of attacks to obtain additional information on defender's strategy for example, by setting up a decoy attack first and performing the real attack on the real valuable target later. So how to address these sequential attacks? Well, to model this kind of problems, we can use security games with sequential attacks. And this model is kind of similar to the Stackelberg security games where we have a set of important targets and limited number of security resources to protect these targets. However, unlike the Stackelberg security games, this model assumes that there are multiple rounds of the game. And in each round of the game, there is one attack carried out by the attacker. And after that attack, the game moves to the next round. So how these games actually work? Let's assume this small example with four targets and two security resources to protect these targets. And assume that the defender deployed an allocation of security resources to individual targets represented by marginal probabilities per resource, which corresponds to his strategy. Then let's assume that the attacker decided to attack the target one. In that case, the defender can either protect successfully the target with security resource one or with security resource two, or that target remains unprotected. And as you can see, in this model, it is assumed that whenever a target is actually attacked, that the damage done to the target is all assumed to be done, and therefore that target won't be available for the remainder of the game. Furthermore, when the attack target is protected by security resource, that resource has to resolve that attack, and therefore it cannot be used for protecting targets in the future rounds. Finally, the resource or the allocation of remaining resources to remaining targets is then used as an initial allocation of resources in the next round. And as I already mentioned, there are some initial allocations of resources and stuff like that. So look, just look at the round of the game from the defender's perspective. So at the beginning of each round, there is an initial allocation of security resources to individual targets represented, as I already mentioned, as marginal probabilities per resource. Then during the round, the defender can change this allocation of resources to targets. And this new modified allocation represents his mixed strategy for that round of the game. And finally, during the execution phase, the defender employs a pure strategy, which is sampled from his mixed strategy. The attacker is aware of the mixed strategy of the defender for the round. However, he doesn't know which targets will be protected during the execution phase. However, after the game moves to the next round, it is revealed to the attacker whether their lastly attacked target was protected or not. However, the security status of the remaining targets remains hidden from the attacker. 
And previous work on the security games with sequential attacks focus on settings both with resource movement and no resource movement. However, for the resource movement setting, previous work doesn't assume reallocation cost and it's limiting the game only to two attacks, two rounds of the game. However, in previous work, it was shown that taking into account sequential attacks significantly affects outcomes of the game in favor of the defender. So in our work, we focus on the resource movement setting with reallocation cost or cost for reallocating security resources. And we were addressing the computation limitations of the previous work and increasing the number of attacks during, during the game. And to do so, we represented the security game with sequential attacks as one-sided partial observable stochastic game. And that's possible due to the both models assume some information asymmetry where one player has full information on the game and the other one has just partial information. Therefore, the security games with sequential attacks, the player with full information is the defender and the partial information player is the attacker. And the rounds of the security game with sequential attacks corresponds to what we call states of one-sided partial observable stochastic game. And these states can be easily represented by the set of remaining resources in that state or round, set of the remaining targets in that state, number of remaining attacks until the end of the game is reached, and the initial allocation of resources for that round for that state. And the possibility of representing security games with sequential attacks as one-sided partial observable stochastic games allowed us to use state-of-the-art methods for solving one-sided partial observable stochastic games, where the method of choice we pick is the heuristic search value iteration. And we picked this algorithm since it was recently shown that this algorithm is capable of solving large instances of one-sided partial observable stochastic games. And it's due to this na his nature and the fact that it combines heuristic search with piecewise linear convex representations of value functions. And the goal of this algorithm is to approximate the optimal value functions where it uses mapping each relief point to a value of the game, where for the security games with sequential attacks, the belief points correspond to the initial allocations in the states. And to do so, it uses upper and lower bound on the optimal value function and iteratively refines these bounds by solving sequences of stage games, which involves searching for optimal strategies of both players in each stage game, which means solving linear program for each bound. And to be able to use the heuristic search value iteration algorithm for solving security games with sequential attacks, we had to modify the original linear programs used in the algorithm to reflect the specificities of the security games with sequential attacks. And you can, you can find the modified linear programs in our paper. And based on this modified version of heuristic search value iteration, we proposed two algorithms where the first one is an exact algorithm providing exact solution of the problem. However, this algorithm has to consider all possible joint reallocation actions in the game, which results in extremely large action space, which is actually exponential in the number of resources. And to this algorithm scales pretty poorly with increased size of the game. And to address the issue with the large action space, we propose a simplified algorithm, which is a simplified version of the exact algorithm where we tackle the high number of actions by assigning mutual disjoint sets of targets to resources, which ensures that there is only one resource assigned to protect a target in a time, which means we don't have to consider the all possible joint reallocation actions, and we can compute the allocation for, for each resource separately. And this re results in reduced size of action space, which is now linear in the number of resources, and of course, in improved scalability. And we experimentally evaluated both proposed algorithms on sets of randomly generated games, 
where the algorithms were expected to solve each instance of a game in given time limit of two hours and memory limit of 32 gigabytes. And we considered the game to be solved when the algorithm reaches gap between the upper and lower bound equal to 1% of initial gap, the gap after the first very first iteration of the algorithm. And when evaluating the algorithms, we focused on their scalability, solution quality, and robustness of provided, provided strategies. So for scalability, we compare two algorithms based on their average runtime to solve instance of given size. When comparing two algorithms based on the solution quality, we use the average difference between values of attacker's best responses and for strategy robustness, we were focusing on the average difference between the upper bound and the attacker's best response for that corresponding strategy of the defender. And every time the rewards, rewards, rewards were involved, we assume rewards from the attacker's point of view. So the defender is minimizing player and the attacker is maximizing. So every time lower is, is better. So when comparing algorithms based on the solution quality, we pick the proposed exact algorithm as a baseline to which we compared two other possible approaches to solve security games with sequential attacks, or the first one being proposed simplified algorithm, and the second one solving each round of the game as a separate Stackelberg security game. And as you can see in the figure, it showed up that solving each round as a separate Stackelberg security game is the worst approach out of these three, where the solving each round as separate Stackelberg security game yields significantly worse results with higher variance than both of the proposed algorithms. On the other hand, the proposed simplified algorithm was capable of producing solutions with quality comparable to the exact algorithm and with results with low variance. And as you can see, the quality of the solution provided by simplified algorithm was even getting closer to the quality of exact algorithm with increased size of the game. Uh, when speaking about the scalability, we were comparing proposed exact and simplified algorithm and we were comparing these algorithms based on the average runtime needed to solve an instance of given size and also the percentage of instances that weren't solved by the, by the algorithms, where the unsolved instances weren't solved either due to the exceeding the time limit or the memory limit. So in this figure, in the upper part, you can see the average runtimes for the simplified and exact algorithm. And in the bottom part, you can see those percentages of unsolved instances. And as you can see, the exact algorithm is capable to scale up to six targets and three resources for fixed number attacks of two, where the simplified algorithm is capable to scale up to 10 targets and five resources for the same setting. And on this figure, you can see similar results on different sides of the instances, where you can see that the exact algorithm doesn't scale beyond two resources when the number of targets is fixed to eight and the number of attacks is fixed to four, where the simplified algorithm is capable to scale up to five resources with the same setting. And finally, we are focusing also on the robustness of strategies produ produced by the simplified algorithm on large instances. However, due to the large, to those instances being too large for the, for the exact algorithm, we weren't able to solve these instances by the exact algorithm. So we cannot compare to the exact values. And therefore we, did what I already mentioned, that we focus on the difference between the upper bound value and the value of the best attacker's best response to the corresponding strategy. And 
what we were what we were looking for was that the positive difference between this antifreeze best response and the upper bound value to be minimum. Because since the defender is minimizing and the attacker is maximizing, we would like to see the value of the attacker's best response to no, not over exceed the upper bound value by a large margin. Ideally, we want it to be on par or even below that. And as you can see in this figure, that was actually the results we obtained for the proposed simplified algorithm, where as you can see, the positive difference between the best response and the upper bound is pretty low, and it's even decreasing with the increased size of the game. So to sum up our work, we were able to represent Stackelberg security game security games with sequential attacks as one-sided partial observable stochastic games. And we were successfully successful in modifying and using heuristic search value iterations for solving these games. And this allowed us to increase the possible number of rounds assumed in the security games with sequential attacks. Finally, we were able to propose to algorithms based on the modified version of heuristic search value iteration where we proved that the simplified version algorithm scales significantly better with minimal loss in quality compared to the exact algorithm. And our work also opens possible directions for further researching in the era of security games with sequential attacks where one of the possible direction could be focusing on key parts of proposed algorithms and improving them to achieve even better scalability. And the second direction could be modifying the proposed algorithms to support not just zero sum security games with sequential attacks, but also general sum security games with sequential attacks and computation of strong Stackelberg equilibrium. And that's all from me. Thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to answer your questions. So thanks, Peter, for this nice presentation. And uh, if there are any questions at this point, seems like none. Uh, I had one question. So can you comment yep. on uh, the? I mean, the basically you're reducing the computational complexity by pre-assigning the resources to targets. Yeah. So uh, is there any idea about what is the lack in the, I mean, what is the gap in the performance due to this pre-assignment? Are, are there interesting heuristics to reduce this gap? Well, in the experiments we perform, we try to assign these targets to resources in a somewhat uniform manner where we sorted up these targets based on the, their value to the attacker in the descending order and then assigning them one by one to, to the individual resources until all, all, all targets were distributed. And as you could see, this yielded pretty good results. However, in some scenarios, there are situations where these assignments are slightly affecting the results in a negative manner. And for sure, there can be, we can come up with some better better heuristic for doing this okay thanks uh, uh if there are no more questions let's just thank the speaker and then move to the next one so the next speaker is guanze peng from nyu and okay. he will be presenting on a data-driven distributionally robust game using washerstein distance so guanze the yeah. Floor is yours. Yep. okay um let me share the screen um uh, can you see? Hello? Yeah, we okay, can you see. Guys see my screen? Yeah, we can, we can see the okay. screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about a special class of games, which is called data-driven distribution robust game uh, using Washington distance. So Guangzhou, uh, can yep. you uh, maximize the screen? Uh, I, I mean, think... uh, because we can also see your side panels. So is it possible to maximize the slide? Uh, uh, let me see. Okay. Uh... Oh, how about now? 
Is it better? No, I can still see, still see your side screens, but go ahead. Uh, let's just move on. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about a special class of game, uh, which is called a uh, data-driven distribution robust game using Washington distance. So we know that cybersecurity problem is generally very challenging and complicated. And why is that? The main reason is there exists uncertainties uh, in cybersecurity. So here I classify cyber uh, uh, uncertainty in cybersecurity into two classes. The first class is called private uncertainty, which is a one-sided uncertainty. Um, for example, the attacker knows his cap uh, capability, but this kind of knowledge may not be available to the defender. And uh, for the defend from the defender side, he knows what his vulnerability is. But again, attacker may not know that. So an, uh, uh, the second uh, type of uncertainty is called common uncertainty. This is a two-sided uncertainty uh, where both the attacker and the defender are uncertain about. Uh, so for example, there may be, um, for example, the internet traffic, uh, the market regulatory, political and cultural expectations, those factors will affect uh, how attacker and the defender behave in the cybersecurity scenario. So one way to cope with uncertainty is to use data. Um, the utilization of data can help the defender to examine, observe, and detect ir irregularities within the network. For example, if the, from the historical data, if the attacker knows that uh, at 2 p.m. every day, the, if the defender knows that at 2 p.m. every day, the attacker is going to launch an attack, then the defender can be precautious and employ some uh, defense mechanisms uh, before it's 2 p.m., right? So, but this data usage in a cybersecurity scenario is a double-blazed war. Why? Because the utilization of data can also help the attacker to, uh, uh, to launch more sophisticated and more advanced attack. So when we talk about the usage of data here, when we talk about the usage, of data, in, especially in a cybersecurity scenario, we must be really uh, cautious because the data may not be always trustworthy. So this brings up the next concept I want to introduce, which is called data integrity. So data integrity is a concept um, that captures the overall uh, accuracy, completeness, and consistency of data. For example, in the cybersecurity scenario, the data that the attacker or the defender has access to may be corrupted or maliciously, maliciously, maliciously designed. Also, the data may only contain very few data points or the data may not be consistent. So in this work, we formulate a game theoretical framework to capture this data-driven feature of the cybersecurity problem while handling the data integrity concern and also we propose a suitable equilibrium concept and a trackable programming to One solve. Thing, uh, yes. Can I, can I, yours, uh, we can't see anything. I mean, no slides are uh, moving. So Fatima, okay. is there some problem on? Um, okay, now I, we can see some new slides, but in between there were no slides that were sh shifting. Okay. Uh, how, how about I just present this way? Yeah, is that's that better. Yeah, I think that's how, because- It's, it's much it's, better. Okay. Yeah, it's on a full for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, but okay. So, in this work, we want to propose a suitable equilibrium concept and a trackable programming to solve for these equilibriums. Um, so, here is the diagram of the game that I propose in this work. So, suppose uh, there exists some uncertainty in this system, and based on historical data or observation or the data set, uh, the players the players, they make estimation of this uncertainty and based on this, this, this estimation, they play the game. Now, let me um, talk about the, uh, introduce the notations, the mathematical notations I use in this work. We use, uh, we, we propose, uh, we consider a, a, a I player uh, game. Um, so we model this uncertainty as the uncertainty parameter C uh, either the C is a scalar or a vector, and the C we assume is a random variable whose true measure is given by P here. And 
we also uh, model the data set as this form. So the data set contains n data points. So each data point is a realization of this uh, random uh, of this uh, random variable, and these are uh, these re uh, realizations are ID, and we assume that both other players they they know the data set, they have access to the data set, and we assume a finite action space uh, for all the players. And the cost function is a mapping from the uh, product of the action space and the uncertainty set to the uh, to some real number, and we we are uh, we focus on the uh, mixed strategies uh, in this work. So the mixed strategy in this work basically is a probability vector uh, lives in this uh, uh, simplex of the action set, and the expected cost function is given by um, averaging the cost function uh, with respect to the action using the mixed strategies. So before I go to the uh, introduction of the uh, proposed game, uh, let me introduce three, three types of games. So the first game I want to introduce is called Nash game. Well, it's a classical game, but um, in Nash game, it's a complete information game and specifically, uh, we, I assume that in this Nash game, I, uh, we consider here the players know the true distribution of the uncertainty parameter C. So the Nash game is given by a tuple here. So the first element is the index of the players. And the second element is the action space. Third element is the uh, cost function. And this uh, set C is the uncertainty set, which um, the uncertainty parameter lives in, and also P is the true distribution or the true measure of this uncertainty parameter. And in Nash game, as I mentioned, that the, all the players know the true distribution of this uh, uncertainty parameter. So uh, in the Nash equilibrium, what do what the players do is simply uh, by uh, uh, averaging out this uncertainty parameter using this uh, uh, true measure P. But we know that in the cyber security pro, uh, in the cyber security scenario, it is uh, nearly impossible for the defender or the, the the attacker to know what the true distribution is. So another way to tackle this uncertainty is to adopt a uh, robust formulation and do not leverage any information from the data set. So so. So now the player are simply being robust to the uh, worst possible case. Uh, so this game, uh, now the player are playing what, a game was so called a robust game. So in the robust game, again, it's given by a tuple. The thing that's missing, missing in the robust game is the uh, true distribution because uh, the players do not know the true distribution of the uncertainty parameter. So, the equilibrium concept considered in the robust game is called robust optimization equilibrium. As we can see that the, uh, how players are coping with uncertainty is by being robust to the worst possible case. And the theorem one basically says that if uh, this cost function is bounded, then there exists a robust optimization equilibrium in the robust game. But, uh, but we, we know that the robust game is not a good solution to tackle uncertainty in the game because uh, the players are being too conservative and they do not leverage any information from the data set. So how do, but if we talk about uh, leveraging information from data set, how do player leverage that? So here I uh, gave the uh, setup of a uh, data-driven game where players are able to use the information from the data set to play the game. Again, the data set, uh, as we assumed in this work, is, is a set that contains n IID realizations of the uncertainty parameter. And we define something called learning rule. Basically, it's a function, it's a mapping from the data set to a distribution of the uncertainty parameter, meaning that the players are trying to use this, this data set to estimate 
the distribution of the uncertainty parameter. And here we consider some of uh, the players uh, called um, empirical player. So the empirical player, they estimate uh, the, uh, the distribution of the uncertainty parameter in an empirical way. They simply, um, they simply form this empirical measure or this empirical distribution from the data set. So the lemma one says that as the number of realizations or the, uh, the number of data points goes to infinity, the players are able to learn the true distribution of the uncertainty parameter. Now, let me introduce the second game. Uh, the second game is called data-driven empirical game. It's a game uh, where the players estimate, uh, where the players use this uh, empirical distribution as the estimation of the distribution of the uncertainty parameter. So as we can see that this game is again given by a tuple, but here uh, the new element in this game is the data set because the player uh, used this data set uh, to form the empirical distribution and the uh, a suitable equilibrium concept in this empirical game, in this data-driven empir empirical game is a Nash equilibrium. Why? Because it's a game uh, uh, with complete but not perfect information, meaning that the players knows uh, everything about the game, but he does not know uh, the true distribution of the uncertainty parameter. So as we can see in the Nash game, uh, in the Nash equilibrium, uh, uh, in the Nash equilibrium considered here, the players average out the uncertainty parameter uh, using this empirical distribution. So, so far everything seems so, everything seems so good, but what's the catch here? What's the catch of this empirical uh, games? So given a tuple of the, uh, of the other player strategy, from the previous discussion, we know that if we discard, if the player discard, disregard the information contained in the data set and play the robust game, they are being too robust. They are being, uh, because they are being robust to the worst possible case. So meaning that the players are simply being too conservative. On the other hand, uh, if we fully trust, what, what, what I mean by fully trust is that the players uh, use this empirical distribution as the estimation of distribution to play the game. If they fully trust the data set and the leverage information contained in the data set, they suffer something called cur the curse of the optimizer, meaning that they are being too optimistic about their uh, about the result, so we in this work we want to find a middle ground between these two uh, extreme cases. We want the players to partially trust the data set, but still leverage the information contained in the data set. So here I define something called suspicion parameter uh, epsilon. So it's a number uh, ranging from zero to infinity. So if epsilon, so basically it, it stands for how suspicious the players are of the information from the data set. If epsilon equal to zero, meaning that the players, they do not have suspicion for, uh, about the data set at all, then the players fully trust the information and they use this uh, empirical distribution to play the game that corresponds to the empirical game I just introduced. And if epsilon goes to inf uh, it is infinity, then the players are extremely suspicious about the data set. Then they do not leverage any information from the data set. And this case corresponds to the robust game I just introduced. So one way to, uh, one way that uh, allows uh, uh, players to partially trust and still leverage information from the data set is to adopt a distributionally robust formulation. Now, uh, let me introduce this uh, distribution robust formulation setup. So basically we form a, uh, a ball 
with this uh, empirical distribution being centered and the players are being robust to the worst possible distribution inside of the ball and the epsilon which i introduced as the suspicion uh, prime uh, as a suspicion parameter is used as the radius of the ball in this case and here so so the the, the uh, distance that um, the metric that we use to measure the distance between two distributions in this ball is the Washington distance. So now uh, this raises, uh, 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 raises two questions. What is Washington distance and why do we use, why do we use Washington distance? So um, here is the definition of Washington distance. I don't want to go to in the detail of the Washington distance, but uh, I just want to give you a uh, intu intuitive interpretation. So basically Washington distance is the least effort of moving the probability mass, probability mass from one measure to another. That is uh, uh, intuitive uh, interpretation of the Washington distance. So, but, but still we, we need to answer another question. Why do we want to use this Washington distance? So the key feature that distinguishing Washington distance and other distribution metric is that the worst case distribution can be supported outside the data set. So what does it mean is that suppose the uncertainty set contains three elements, one, two, three, and the empirical distribution uh, only uh, concentrates on one and two. If we use other, um, if we use other distribution, uh, distribution metric, other um, distribution metric, then the worst case distribution will always concentrate on one and two, and three is simply um, ignored. But we, if but if we use the Washington distance, um, it is possible that the worst case distribution will also concentrate on on the on. On, on three. So here I want to uh, relate this uh, Washington distance uh, with uh, what is currently going on around the world, uh, the pandemic, which is COVID-19. So before COVID-19, people, people around the world had witnessed uh, a Spanish flu and other pandemics. But when people, be but before COVID-19, even though people acknowledge the existence of the pandemic, when they, when they when they make plans, they still, um, they still disregard this possibility of the pandemic. But if we use Washington distance, uh, it, it allows us to take the possibility of this pandemic into consideration. But if we use other, um, if we use other distribution metric, uh, as we can see that it simply disregard the possibility of this pandemic. So that is, um, uh, why we use Washington distance in this framework. So now let me introduce the proposed game here. So here, um, the game is called the data-driven distribution robust game. Uh, it is given again, given by Tapo. The only thing added into this game is this uh, suspicion parameter, as well as uh, the radius of the Washington ball. So the players are being robust to the worst possible distribution inside the Washington ball. And the suitable uh, equilibrium concept is something called distribution robust equilibrium. As we can see that it's a distribution robust uh, formulation for each player. Um, the players, again, as I mentioned, are, is being, are being robust to the, to the worst possible distribution inside the ball. So the theorem two basically says that if uh, this uncertainty set is finite and the cost function is bounded, then there exists at least one distribution robust equilibrium inside in the game defined by this Gn epsilon here. Now here is the, uh, so here is the first takeaway message I want to uh, give you guys. So this distribution robust formulation using Washington ball is an enabler of the data-driven feature of the game. Um, and um, the ambiguity set is described 
because the ambiguity set is described uh, uh, by this empirical distribution and uh, the, the radius of the ball. So that's what distinguishes this uh, distribution robust uh, game uh, from other distribution robust game. And I want to talk about the relationship between the game proposed here and the three type of games I mentioned earlier. So as we can see that if this epsilon goes to infinity, meaning that the, 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 the radius of the Washington ball goes to infinity, or in another way, uh, if the suspicion uh, parameter goes to infinity, meaning that the players they do not trust this, uh, uh, to do not trust the information contained in the data set at all, then the game will become the, uh, the classical robust game I just uh, introduced. If this epsilon goes to zero, meaning that the players, the players are not suspicious about the data set, then they uh, simply use this uh, empirical distribution to average out the uncertainty parameter, then the game becomes the data-driven empirical game. And if the, the, the number of data, uh, the, number, the number of data points go to infinity, and also this epsilon go to zero, then our game will become the Nash game where the players know the true distribution of the uncertainty parameter. So as we can see that this data-driven distribution bus game generalized these three games with only two parameters. The first parameter is the uh, uh, wall system ball radius or the uh, um, suspicion parameter. The second parameter is the number of data points. So that's another takeaway message is that our proposed game uh, it, it generalized um, the three types of games with only two parameters. So that is a very, uh, a, a generalization of a very simple form. So now, since we have talked about this game, how do we solve for the equilibrium inside, the, inside this game? How do we solve for the distribution robust equilibriums? So uh, I don't want to go, to in, uh, go into the details of this mathematical programming, uh, but what I want to say is that if we solve for this math ma mathematical programming, um, then we are able to find the distribution robust equilibrium inside this, uh, uh, inside this proposed game. And if we look at this math mathematical programming, basically it is uh, programming where this objective function is linear and, uh, and we, uh, most of these constraints are linear, except that there are only uh, some constraints are, are, are quadratic. So it's not something that's uh, very complicated to solve. Um, so we also have a toy example here, as we can see, it's, uh, I consider a uh, bimatrix game. Uh, so there is uncertainty in this uh, pale function of the first player. So I consider the case where this uncertainty set is given by minus one and one, and the true distribution is a binary distribution uh, with one half uh, for, uh, uh, sorry, this should be C equal to minus one for the case where C equal to minus one and C equal to one. So uh, I'm sorry, um, this is uh, not uh, easy to see, but what I want to see, what I want to say from these figures is that even though the distribution robust game adopts a distribution robust formulation, but it doesn't always yield a, a, um, a worse uh, performance uh, when we compare this game with the empirical game. And why is that? The reason why is um, when the, when, when play, uh, we consider a two player case. When the first player adopt this distribution robust formulation using Washington distance, the second player is also doing the same. He also adopts a distribution robust formulation. So, so it doesn't always yield a worse uh, result compared to the empirical game. And another interesting phenomenon here is that no matter which game, no matter uh, which game formulation we are considering here, the, the payoff of player two uh, is unaltered. And why is that is because for each possible uncertainty in the uncertainty set, 
this game is always fully mixed, meaning that there's no, um, there's no uh, a pure Nash equilibrium. So in, in, in the case where there's no pure Nash equilibrium, um, the player strategy, the, the, the first player strategy only depends on the second player's payoff function. And, it, and also another feature of this fully mixed case is that um, the, the second player's uh, action only depends on the first player's strategy, meaning that if the second player's payoff function, uh, the, the second player's payoff matrix doesn't change, then the first player action doesn't change, and then the pay, uh, the payoff of second player doesn't change as well. So, so as we can see from the, this figure that the, the player two's payoff function stays the same for every possible for for every um, uh, game formulation we I consider here. Now let me conclude this work. We have formalized a class of games, uh, which is a generalization of robust game and data-driven uh, empirical game. And the proposed game framework tackles the challenge that arises, uh, arises from the, the uh, data integrity when the data is not trustworthy. And also we propose a mathematical programming to solve for the, the equilibriums and predict the attacker and defender's behavior in this case. So the future work can be uh, explored into, in two direction, directions. The first direction is uh, uh, a Bayesian game direction. So when there exists private information, uh, so we must resort to this Bayesian game framework because in reality, um, the attacker and defender always has private information. They have something that the other player doesn't know. So another uh, direction is the data-driven dynamic game. Um, so we can consider uh, this, uh, uh, this game in a dynamical setting um, where the players, when they play the game, they accumulate uh, the observation and, uh, uh, and use this automated observation inside this watcher symbol. And that's it, thank you. Uh, thanks, Guanju. Uh, there is one yeah. question. From yes. Uh, so this is from Yinan Hu. Uh, may I ask how you choose epsilon? How is it empirically related to the amplitude of the other values? And uh, may I request the next speaker, Stefan, to uh, join in? Uh, uh, Guanju, you can answer this question. Okay. So, uh, okay. So the uncertainty parameter. When you choose the uncertainty parameter. You you can choose a. It's a basically it's a function of your data points. As long as that as long as when the data points go to infinity, your and certainly the sequence of your, um, the read uh, your epsilon goes to infinity because. So uh, let me rephrase that. So basically, when your data points goes to infinity, and your uh, epsilon goes to zero then it's fine. You can choose the epsilon as uh, log n or something like that. Uh, one, one over log n, something like that, form like that, or one over n. And, okay. and, and what's, the, what's the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Uh, I think, I think we, uh, the second part is how is it empirically related to the amplitude of other values? Oh, yes. Uh, 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 I think to answer that question is there's no certain answer to that question unless you have a very special form of the game. For example, your um, cost function satisfies certain properties like monotonicity, then we can answer that question. But here, I do not consider that specific form. So it's, uh, there's no generalized solution to that uh, answer to that question. Thank you. Okay, let's thank okay. Wanzi again for the great talk. And uh, can we move to now the next speaker, which is uh, Stefan Ras. And uh, Stefan will be talking about uh, security games over lexicographic orders. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect.
So welcome everyone. Um, thanks especially for the organizing committee for making this wonderful conference possible despite all the, the complications of Corona these days. I'm very happy to be here um, and it's my pleasure to present a bit of research that we jointly did with uh, Angelika Wiegele, who's also from our university, but unfortunately with us today, but also Sandra Koenig uh, from the Austrian Institute of Technology, who I said um, could join us for the talk today. So. What we're going to show you in the next couple of minutes is really something that came out of conversations with practitioners in various projects that we had on uh, where we try to apply and game theory practically to the protection of critical infrastructures and other problems of, the, of similar kind. And um, <clears throat> it turned out that the optimal solutions that we found in many contexts were actually not precisely what these people could expect or what they would actually have needed or would have actually would implement. So we took this as a motivation to look into a different uh, kind of ordering for making decisions, which is lexicographic orders. And um, this is what the talk is going to be about. So in all the conversations or in many conversations with practitioners, we actually found or the, uh, came to the conclusion that optimality and plausibility of an optimum are essentially very different things. So there can be many equilibria in the game, but only a very few of them could actually make practical sense. Question is why, and if we know the why, next question is what are we going to do about it? So we found that many, in many cases, equilibria would need some sort of refinement or optima in general would need refinement because some constraints simply go forgotten. If you uh, talk to people or talk to your customers in a way for your optimization problem, they give you roughly an idea what would be required to them. You come back with an optimal solution and these guys then respond, well, that's nice, but we're not gonna do that because uh, maybe some other constraints have simply not been included. So it comes to a back and for backward and forward uh, iteration of the model refinement and uh, solutions uh, being improved and updated over and over again. Other uh, sources why uh, solutions optima might not just be practical or useful to uh, the people that we were talking to were really rooting in bounded rationality. So uh, essentially we can all, could also say we have a badly constructed utility measure in a way. So the model itself is nice, it's solvable, but the way we construct a utility function simply doesn't match with what these people were expecting. So the idea here and what motivated this work is maybe if an optimum or an equilibrium isn't practically plausible, uh, maybe we can just refine it by taking second and, and uh, third considerations as goal in, goals into account. So it, may really, it might really be that there is not only one priority that people go for, but there may be several ones and those come in a natural order of preference. And that actually goes down even to the very basic goals of security, which is confidentiality, integrity, availability, because uh, whether depending on what kind of company you are, uh, you might even have completely reversed priorities here. So if you're a company that processes data and lives from data processing, uh, top priority might certainly be confidentiality because information secrecy is your business capital. Second goes integrity because whenever you have incorrect information, you're producing wrong output artifacts and of course availability, but availability might just go down the list because you might have, you, there, there should be backups available, at least the medium educated security people are in charge. Um, if you are a, a production oriented enterprise, those uh, priorities are actually opposite. So first goes availability because once your production line stops, you're losing money at the same instant. Integrity is of course a concern because it would actually increase the dropout rates if you have uh, badly configured systems. But confidentiality is sure, or in many cases, not exactly the top priority because many details of your product might become publicly known anyway. And uh, there might be data to be confidential, but it's not as crucial as it is for availability. So those kind of priorities are actually there and uh, modeling the game with, set, with different uh, goals and uh, optimizing them in the same uh, simultaneously is 
not is not a new problem. So with, with multi-criteria optimization, the classical or traditional way of approaching it is, if you're given a set of payoff vectors, uh, which comes as a vector of several functions, u1, u2, until un, you could simply scalarize them into a single goal. And if you impose cons uh, very common constraints like adding those, weight those weights to one and demanding them all to be larger than zero, you end up with a Pareto optimal solution or a Pareto Nash equilibrium if you do it right. Um, if you go for a more sophisticated form of scalarization, you could actually aim for Choquet integration. Um, that is actually kind of very flexible. Uh, but it requires a quantification of the interdependencies between the goals, uh, technically coming to monotone set functions or um, more complicated set to capacity functions. Uh, in a way, it's the, 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 the challenge that you have there is that you model something that, is, that looks like a probability but doesn't behave like one. And um, if you ever try to set up um, a probabilistic model, you know how difficult that is. If you also try to sell that model to someone outside the field, you know that's even more difficult. But if it comes to both, like um, doing something that is like probabilistic modeling, but actually is more general than that, uh, you're kind of getting an idea of how challenging that can be. So Choquet integration is a very interesting, nice concept, but it can be hard for practitioners to get on. So the proposed method that we have, the method that we propose here is actually very, very simple. It's a lexicographic optimization in the order of the goal priorities, which means that we're not actually worried about a certain uh, weights to be assigned here. Oh, sorry. Uh, of certain weights that we assign because those weights would actually go for importances and we would be uh, required to say this goal is let's say twice as important as the other goal it might not just be uh, easy to to uh, give any such uh, estimation and we don't we don't need to ponder about goal interdependencies very much so we don't we spare all those quantitative modeling of capacities or uh, correlations between the goals maybe so we can uh, more or less leave that aside, which is at the same time a downside, of course. So if we know that how these goals actually interplay, uh, it would certainly be good to include it if it were possible, bringing us back to scalarization. But um, let's suppose for the moment, for the time being, that we're not going to do that. So we're um, actually trying to optimize those goals in a certain sequence and doing lexicographic optimization. So technically, uh, we assume our decision makers to make their decisions with several goals in mind and with a fixed priority, which comes to a lexicographic order. But that can be difficult in general game theory um, for a very uh, in simple reason, because the lexicographic preference that we impose on our action spaces might just not uh, induce a nice utility function. And uh, somewhat interestingly, it's a very much a folklore result that we state here, and we included it mostly because uh, uh, we ourselves know that result very well. We know that many people do know, uh, but we uh, had a lot of difficulties finding it uh, in a citable form anyway. So if you have a, a, a reference where this is actually proven, please let me know. If you actually refer to that result elsewhere, you now have a reference with this paper. Um, the statement is that even on a totally ordered set in a two-dimensional space where we just consider the unit square, if you lexicographically order the vectors in that sense, there is no continuous function that would represent that lexicographic order in the way as stated. But unfortunately for much, or not all, but much of game theory, we actually need such continuous uh, functions because Nash theorem and anything that builds upon it does really rely on continuity. And given that we don't have a continuous function in the most general case, so under certain restrictions, you regain the continuous function representation again. But the most general situation is there is no continuous function to represent a lexicographic order. We can't rely on classical results to give us equilibria. That's what makes the use of lexicographic ordering interesting. And um, it might not be surprising at all once you see the algorithm, but it's still the case that we can very easily deal with the, the situation. Um, so the algorithm that we propose here is it's really very simple 
concept, uh, you let the utilities functions come uh, uh, in a descending order of importance. Let's say the U1 is the most important goal to optimize. And if we, uh, and we're breaking ties there, uh, considering a secondary goal, and again, breaking ties there, considering a, third, a ternary goal and so on. And um, to simplify matters for here, uh, we assume those to be matrix games whatever way they're being set up. Like we had very interesting talks before on how to set up this, which is also a very important problem. But we just consider those games to be available just to simplify matters and represent them as, as the usual pay of matrices. And we let the interaction be all zero sum because we're having security games here. Um, we're having an idea of the action space of our opponent, but we don't have an idea of his payoff uh, functional. So those function, those payoff matrices are only our own payoffs. We don't know what the opponent's payoffs are, and we don't even are in, we aren't even that much interested in it. So we can just assume a zero sum competition here. So the algorithm uh, really starts with the first goal to optimize, and then actually ends by putting that into a new game with payoff matrix B, and then go and compute all the Nash equilibria for that game. That's the computationally heavy part. So we have we require an enumeration of all those Nash equilibria, and fortunately there are algorithms to enumerate all of them um, for two-player games at least. And those equilibria or any combination thereof, convex combination or exchange of elements here from the pairs, defines the um, payoff, uh, defines the strategy space for the next stage game. So we take those equilibria and actually construct a new matrix whose dimension is actually square and is the si uh, and count and, and is the dimensionality being the size of the equilibrium set here. Um, and let us all, let all equilibria here, even though are mixed, they, can, they go into the next game and define the payoffs there. And on that newly constructed, uh, newly constructed payoff matrix, we repeat the algorithm as long as we have goals to optimize. And if we run out of goals, we terminate and return whatever strategy, whatever optimum set we have found in the last round. So it's actually a very simple procedure. We just solve for the first game and constrain the solution on the next game to be only on the space of optima of the previous game and keep refining uh, the set of equilibria iteratively down until we have all the goals optimized. So let's collect a few observations here. First is for all K, and that's more as a simple induction argument, we have a finitely representable set of games because we have a finite games assumed here. So the algorithm is in a way well-defined. We can enumerate all the equilibria in reasonable, at least finite time. And we can uh, in turn set up the equilibrium, uh, the, the new payoff structure per round. Um, any equilibrium in the new payoff structure is just a convex combination of the equilibria in the previous payoff structure. So we're just optimizing over points that have been optimal in the past round. And again, by induction, we instantly conclude that whatever we do here, we just boil down the set of, the set of optima, but we retain optimality along all stages up to K whenever the algorithm is at optimizing the goal number K. And, um, What's also nice about this is the effect that it narrows down the set of equilibrium. So Nash equilibria are known to be notoriously non-unique. And um, in this way, and by including more and more goals, we can just refine this set other than uh, other very sophisticated methods like going for a more um, informed concept of equilibrium, like going from a Nash equilibrium to a perfect, perfect equilibrium or similar, uh, we just uh, condense or reduce the number of optima found by considering more and more goals as long as we find the, the, the optima that we have not plausible because there could be other things to consider besides what we have so far. The good thing is that the, the number of optima that we're considering here and the number of Nash equilibria can never grow along this way. So it only is possible that it narrows down. It can become stationary at some point and not further shrink, but it can never grow. So just to give you a brief, very sh uh, brief example, I was mentioning that um, 
this has one application or one particular potential practical use uh, to for the sake of reducing the number of equilibria if we find something not uh, plausible and uh, it turns out that it was quite not not actually trivial to give examples of games that actually have multiple equilibria and whose set actually really boils down. So we had a choice between giving you a purely artificial example or giving you one that you can relate to maybe from your practical background. And we went for the second option here and uh, considered a very, very simple model for downloading software or downloading data from different service. So the scenario that you have, uh, that you find depicted here in the right is more or less what you should, act, what you very well know uh, whenever you use open source software. So you actually download your latest distribution of uh, let's say Mozilla Firefox browser. And uh, if you do it right, you should actually verify the cryptographic fingerprint against an independent mirror, just to make sure you're not falling victim to a drive-by download of malware. So the game is actually simple. We have a set of mirrors to choose from. One mirror should be where, where we download our data from. The other mirror is where we check our data against. And um, if the hash or the fingerprint matches what the second mirror tells us, then we would accept the data from the first down mirror as being okay. And we can use the data in any way we like. So if we have different priorities, again, reminding uh, about the two kinds of companies that we were giving in the previous, in the example before. So we could be a company that processes data, or we could be a company that process, uh, that manufactures something. Priorities are different. So the data processing is goes confidentiality beats availability. Manufacturing says availability would go uh, rank higher than confidentiality. And um, just to, to uh, give more, to make the example more concrete, uh, let's say we have a generic payoff structure to keep things simple here, which are very simple probabilistic reasoning. We pick the role player is the administrator who picks the service to download and verify against, and the column player is the adversary who picks the service to compromise. Let's suppose there are two of them, just to keep the example very simple and to get two different payoff structures out of the same reasoning here. And let's further suppose that we have some assumed some probability of being hacked, which is resilience that you can get from normal security risk uh, assessment, maybe, or for, from a vulnerability scan. There is a probability of failure, which is the reliability of those nodes. Say those are mostly reliable, but do have their um, chances to be not reachable in a way. And that way we get very simple payoff structures here for a confidentiality game could look like that for the availability game it could look like this matrix. Again, not saying that this is uh, precisely a practical or a very realistic example it's really a toy example just to have two different payoff structures coming out of a similar reasoning. And then showing well, how the equilibria would actually turn out on the lexicographic order and it's actually very simple because. Uh, if in the first case, if confidentiality outranks availability, we go for the first payoff structure, which is just a confidentiality game because it's the highest ranking here, and then find that there is only one equilibrium here. And that gives us a one by one payoff structure for the second game, which is trivial to solve because there is nothing to solve. It has only one pure, pure equilibrium, which carries over from the confidentiality game. What we get there is the values for each of those game being the guaranteed performances uh, in terms of confidentiality and availability. So if we go for a solution in this order of preference, we get a 94% assurance that data will be confidential and a 75% assurance that the data will be available. If we reverse our um, priorities, we go for the availability game first. Again, finding a unique equilibrium in this game, which naturally carries over uh, along the algorithm to the second game. And we find different assurances here. So there is an, at least 89% for availability and at least 82% for confidentiality. Different numbers. The um, inequalities come from the fact that we're playing a security game here and uh, the adversary could have different intentions as we presume. So there are chances that it deviates and as such increases our payoffs here. So practically, at least for two goals, in many cases, it's, uh, it can be very simple. 
uh, we try to validate that also on less trivial examples. And uh, for that method, it turned out that it's quite difficult to find games, zero-sum games that have desired sets of equilibria. And uh, for that matter, we proposed a very simple instance of mechanism design, who's, uh, which you will find in the appendix. If you look in the details, we state that as a lemma, saying that whatever equilibria you pick for both of those players, you will find the two-person zero-sum matrix game whose set of equilibria is precisely what you have chosen, or more or less the convex combination thereof. Proof is in the paper, so with an eye on the clock, I would uh, luckily skip that. Uh, interestingly to note is that this problem is way simpler for non-zero-sum games than it is for zero-sum games. So concluding that, um, the overall finding is really that decision-making with goal priorities is actually not too difficult, even though um, lexicographic orders aren't easy to use in game theory. So it's practically feasible. Um, we will in future try looking this, uh, generalizing this to non-zero-sum games and to more complex game models. And um, perhaps an interesting question that we stumbled upon is, uh, we really need a method of enumerating equilibria. We can do that for Nash games. Question is, can we do efficient enumeration of equilibria of all equilibria for other games as well? And leaving you with that open question, my only open point is thanking you for your time, for your listening. Hope you find it, found it interesting. And I'm happy to take questions and look forward to it. Stefan, thanks for a really nice talk. Uh, let's see. So there is probably uh, so there is one question from yes. Malik. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Cannot we define a vector of payoff functions with respect to the mixed policies of players? For example, the first function could be the expected payoffs, while the second one is the variance of payoffs. Thus, you will have a vector of game values of which we first find the equilibria with respect to the first function. Once we have the value for the first yeah. type game, then within the equilibria of the first game, we solve the second game and so yeah. on. Yeah. So if the question was about possibility of that, certainly yes. Okay, so you agree that this can be a, uh, you can define a vector of payoff functions yes. and find mixed policy. Yes. Of course, I think that's a that's even a very very nice example. That um, it's almost a pity that we didn't didn't have that thought ourselves to present here. Um, yes, actually, I think it makes very much sense, and certainly is possible. Okay, uh, if there are, there are no more questions at this point, uh, so we thank you again for this nice talk. So thank that, you very much. I think I'll hand it over back to Professor Barros. For the bars, okay, we sorry. We got here. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we have a break now for 15 minutes. We'll start the second se session in uh, 12.45. Okay? We will start at 12.45 p.m. Yes. I'll try to put this slide up from my screen. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you see the. I'll just leave this up so people know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for attending and thanks for the speakers. Kwan Yan is on, then the, the three speakers are on. We have them for next one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for them, um, I think. Okay. Christos is here with the Basalik. I'm also here, Selek here, so. Yeah, but the looks last like one. we're missing Muhammad. Okay, so, so no, no Muhammad, Muhammad is here. I see him. Okay. I see him in the list. I don't know if it is uh, attendee or panelist. Okay, I think I think uh, a panelist. He is here. Okay. Oh, he, yeah. Forgive me. I thought he, uh, he, someone else must have promoted him. Thank you. No, I don't know, but I, since I have the slide on, I cannot see 
the two different classes. So I see. No, I, I was working with. Um, yeah, that's fine. Fatima. She probably took care of it for me. I just yeah. missed just, it. Thank just, you. For, just from what you have, and that's it. We are, we are set yep. up. Very good. Thank you. And now you have a different student. It's Amulia. Is he on? Um, not yet, I don't believe. Okay. No, he's not here yet. Yeah, okay. So, Fatima, can you send him an email? Because I don't want you to be late. Yes, I'll do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatima. My pleasure. I'm going to step away for a moment, John. I'll be right back. That's fine. No problem.
So, Quenzan, you have the floor. Sorry, John, stay it again. Quanzan is the next chair, right? Yes, I, I'm in the next chair. So you should take over because it's 12.45, right? So we have Muhammad here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess Tamir should be here also. And Akristos is here. And uh, I think the only one that is missing is the, um, the last speaker. I, I, I don't know who is this last speaker. He so, was the, he's there, Salik, right? Salik, Salik, yeah. he's here. Salik, I see oh, okay. him. Good, good. Yeah, I think we are all here. I see him, right? Yes, I think we can get started. Um, maybe we yeah. can ask uh, um, uh, Muhammad Anik. Are you here? Hi, uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, so, so why don't you um, uh, share your screen? Um, okay. And we can get started. So uh, I think it's 12:45. I think it's uh, we can start on time. All right. Let me share your screen. Okay. Just about 20, 20 minutes, and then plus or minus plus four or five minutes. Okay, for questions. Right. Thank you. I'm gonna go. Right. So um, hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, so we are um, at section session five, cyber physical systems. And uh, our first talk is going to be given by Mohammed Anik, um, and uh, the uh, the title of this talk his talk is a secure discrete time linear quadratic mean field games. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Quinn. Uh, so my talk uh, titled uh, "Secure Discrete Time Linear Quadratic Mean Field Games," and uh, we did this work along with uh, my collaborators, uh, Sujay and Professor Bashar. Uh, so in this in this uh, in this game, what we have is uh, we have a secure n agent linear quadratic game, and uh, it's a large population game, and uh, each agent is trying to solve a consensus problem. Uh, uh, each agent aims to align itself or its state with the aggregate behavior. So that's what the consensus problem means. Uh, however, the agent is comprised of a sensor and a controller, and uh, these uh, sensor and controller are connected through a noiseless channel. Uh, this channel is susceptible to eavesdropping by adversaries. So uh, this channel is, can be listened to by, by, uh, by the adversaries. And uh, here we provide a, 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 a diagram for the, of the agent and the adversary. So you can see that the sensor is, uh, is listening to the or, or observing the state of the agent and it's transmitting uh, some sketched version of the state over over a channel to the controller uh, now this channel is although it's noiseless but it's uh, it's susceptible to eavesdropping by some adversary and uh, th that's the reason why the sensor chooses to sketch the state before transmitting it over the channel so the sketching, so since the sketching involves some, uh, some sort of compression of the state, uh, we need a fast access to, the, to this channel, to this, to this uh, sketch state for the controller to be able to reconstruct the state of the, uh, of the agent uh, in, a, in a nice manner. So that's why we need a fast, fast access to this, uh, this channel so that uh, the sketched state can be reconstructed at the side of the controller, which then can use this uh, reconstructed state and uh, control the system. Uh, so the sensor uses a, a private key to uh, sketch the state of this of the of the agent, and this key is only known to the agent and no one else. So that's why it's private, and that's what preserves the security of the game. Uh, the adversary uh, is, is considered to be non-strategic, so it, it does not have any control input into the agent or into the system. Also, it has no cost function that it's trying to minimize. It is just a passive uh, listening adversary and we, we aim to obfuscate uh, uh, the information of the adversary. So, uh, so, so here are the main results and organization of the paper. Uh, first, we introduced the secure N agent linear quadratic game. Uh, and also it's uh, an infinite agent counterpart, which is the secure uh, linear quadratic mean field game, also called the SLQ MFG. Uh, this in, in, in mean field games in uh, well game theory literature, uh, uh, mean field games are a very useful tool 
that uh, where we go to infinite population games and we can we can obtain some approximately optimal or approximately equilibrium strategies for the finite AI population games. Uh, so so after after formalizing this uh, problem, we uh, we proposed our secure communication mechanism, uh, which involves this state sketching uh, on the side of the sensor and then state reconstruction on the side of the controller inside each agent. Uh, and then we proved that the mean field equilibria of the vanilla LQMFG. So the mean field equilibria is a, is a concept which is similar to the Nash equilibrium, uh, but it's for the mean field games. Uh, this will be, uh, will be introduced later on into the paper. And the vanilla LQMFG is the game, is the mean field game uh, where we don't have any adversity. We don't have uh, this uh, noiseless channel. Uh, it's, it's, that's why we call it the vanilla LQMFG. So we proved that the mean field equilibria of the vanilla LQMFG is an epsilon mean field equilibria or an approximate mean field equilibria for the SLQMFG. And uh, in, for this work, we only consider uh, linear controllers. Uh, furthermore, we show that the mean field equilibria of the standard or the vanilla LQMFG is also an epsilon plus val epsilon Nash equilibria of the finite agent game. So that was our uh, aim from the beginning to provide some sort of approximately optimal or approximately nice strategies for the finite agent game. Uh, finally, we uh, will empirically investigate the performance of the uh, of the, this approximately a Nash equilibrium uh, policies and uh, over some this investigation will be over some perturbation in, uh, in some parameters. Okay. So first we formalize the secure N agent uh, linear quadratic game. Uh, so we consider an N agent game uh, where each agent has a linear dynamics. So the state of the agent is, uh, has, uh, the, is evolving in a linear manner dependent on the, on the last state and the action and there is some noise in the, in the process. Uh, so here you can see there are uh, there are two uh, rates that are going on. So the observations are generated at a faster rate, one over delta. So you can see the deltas here, uh, but the control actions are going are, are taking place at a slower rate, one over tau. So the control actions only change at the, the slower rate, one over tau, and uh, tau and delta are related by this uh, by this relationship. Uh, tau is equal to n times delta where n is also called the sampling rate. So, so we need this fast, uh, fast observation and slow control setup so that we are able to reconstruct the state of the agent uh, at the side of the controller. Uh, the initial uh, state of the agent and the noise process are generated IID according to some second order distribution and uh, the, the, the noise process also has uh, zero mean. Uh, CI, so okay, so uh, the observations are also called YIs or observations are the sketched versions of the state that the sensor transmits over the over the channel. And uh, for this work, we consider uh, linear uh, linear transformations, uh, where CI is also called the private uh, private key, and CI is chosen by each agent uh, uniformly from a set of private keys. Uh, this calligraphic C. And uh, the set is um, uh, and set is basically is a finite set of uh, of matrices. And uh, one uh, condition that has to be satisfied is that uh, the sampling rate has to be higher than the observability matrix of uh, of the pair A and C I. So that's uh, that this this condition is required for uh, for a, a good state reconstruction at the side of the sensor. Uh, since CI is singular, we will need a multi-rate setup, uh, multi-rate setup meaning the faster uh, observations and the so, slow control to reconstruct the state. Uh, each agent aims to uh, minimize, minimize this cost function, which is, uh, uh, which is an average cost function over infinite horizon. And you can see here that the state, the agent aims that the state of the agent should be close to this aggregate of the uh, states of all the other agents in this uh, finite population game. And also it needs to uh, make its control effort. It also needs to minimize its control effort. So that's the cost that each agent aims to minimize. 
uh, the solution concept used in the in the finite population uh, game is also called the is, is the Nash equilibrium. Okay, so so solving for Nash equilibrium for, for large population games is sometimes very hard. It gets harder as the number of uh, number of agents increases. So uh, so the, the 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 field of mean field games uh, gives us a very good uh, uh, way to model approximately uh, uh, Nash equilibrium strategies. So, so now what we do is we consider the limiting case where the number of agent goes to infinity. And uh, again, the generic, we consider a generic agent in this, in this game where there are infinitely many players and we remove the subs, uh, subscripts I and otherwise the game is uh, the same. Uh, the cost function of each generic agent is dependent on something called the mean field trajectory which is the aggregate behavior of infinitely many agents. So we assume that here that the mean field trajectory is actually uh, X bar is, is, is a deterministic quantity. And uh, the state of the agent is, uh, the, the agent is trying to minimize its difference from this aggregate behavior. And also it's trying to minimize its uh, control effort. And the cost function is the same as before. Uh, so we use the solution concept of mean field equilibrium, uh, which is anal analogous to the Nash equilibrium concept for the finite population games. Uh, before defining this solution concept, we define this operator uh, lambda, uh, which generates a mean field trajectory uh, generated by control law mu. Uh, so this lambda is basically, you can think of it as, uh, as the aggregate behavior generated law mu. So if, if let's say if there are infinitely many players and all the players are uh, are following some control law mu, then what's the average behavior that of the of the of all the agents that's going to be generated? Uh, that's also called the mean field trajectory. So this operator uh, gives you the, the, that average behavior under the control law mu. Uh, so having uh, defined this operator, now we can define the the mean field equilibrium, and mean field equilibrium is always a tuple. Uh, mu star, which is the equilibrium controller for the generic agent, and X bar star, which is the equilibrium mean field tra trajectory generated. So uh, mean field equilibrium has to define this kind of coupled definition where uh, X bar star, the equilibrium mean field trajectory has to be generated, is, is generated by the equilibrium controller mu star, and mu star is the best controller given that mean field, uh, the equilibrium mean field trajectory. So that's the that's the definition of uh, of uh, mean field equilibrium, and it's the analog to Nash equilibrium for the uh, infinite population game. Okay. So here we briefly uh, describe the, uh, the 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 process of state reconstruction and uh, secure communication mechanism using multi rate output sampling. Uh, so if we define y k as the sequence of observations available. To, uh, to the controller, then yk can be written as a linear function of the state of the control and some noise process. Uh, the state can be uh, the state uh, using some matrix manipulations that I'm not going to go into details about. The state of the, of the agent can be written in terms of the, of the previous um, uh, observation sequence yk, the previous control u and some noise and some noise process. So now the controller uh, has observed this uh, observation, the sequence of observations. It also knows the last control input. So now it can generate this new quantity x hat, uh, which is an uh, which is the state estimate. Uh, and, but the state estimate will have some estimation error, w k, uh, which is a, a zero mean uh, a random vector, and it will have some. Uh, uh, I hope you guys can. Oh, sorry, you guys can see this. So, uh, so uh, this uh, this estimation error W will have some covariance matrix uh, sigma C, and uh, it's basically uh, for each private key C, uh, there will be a, a, a distinct covariance matrix sigma C. That's uh, the covariance of the estimation error. Uh, so the so now we look at the mean field equilibria of the SLQ MFG. And we actually show that the mean field equilibrium of the SLQ MFG doesn't exist in the class of linear controllers. So, uh, so uh, we augment the state uh, of the state of the of the generic agent with the mean field trajectory, 
And here we only consider uh, linear mean field trajectories, and that's uh, uh, that's not very restrictive because we are since we are only considering linear controllers. So uh, the uh, um, any mean field trajectory generated by a linear controller will also be uh, linear, and it's it's defined by this matrix F. So the dynamics of this augmented state can be written as uh, as a as a linear uh, system and with, with these A, B, and matrices and this noise process. Uh, the cost of a generic agent under the control log K, so now we assume the, the linear control log K is going to be uh, 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 this uh, quantity. And we observe that the controller which minimizes this, con this cost function under any stable F has this form. So this form is is a is a is a very standard um, uh, LQ uh, optimal control, but it has this extra term, and uh, which is due to this uh, which is due to the uh, um, state uh, reconstruction or the the estimation error. Uh, so here actually we observe that uh, this this term is the covariance matrix of stationary distribution, and it actually is singular. So because it's singular, then uh, uh, K hat uh, does not exist. So, so basically, we have shown that uh, there is for any given any given um, uh, stable f uh, any given mean field trajectory, uh, the optimal controller does not exist. So, hence, uh, the mean field equilibria of the SLQ MFG will not exist in the class of linear controllers. So, what we do now is uh, we define this new definition of uh, epsilon. Uh, mean field equilibria, mean field equilibria of the SLQMFG, and uh, so it's again is a tuple. Uh, first, K prime is the controller. F prime uh, represents the mean field trajectory, and uh, uh, this tuple is is an epsilon MFE if the the mean field trajectory is generated by the controller, uh, and the controller is is uh, at least epsilon optimum. So so if you if you change to any different controller K. Uh, the best you will get is some some uh, epsilon, the best in um, epsilon better performance for that new controller K. So that's uh, that's analogous to the epsilon Nash uh, definition and the epsilon Nash equilibrium. Uh, so now we have uh, this assumption. Um, sorry, so we have this assumption uh, that's a carry forward from the from the literature on uh, vanilla LQMFGs. And uh, so if P uh, is, is, is a unique solution to this uh, Riccati equation and GP and HP are defined as follows, then this quantity has to be uh, less than one. Um, second, okay, yeah, I guess now you can see. So this quantity has to be less than one and this is a carry forward from the, the, from the um, LQMFG literature. So under this assumption, uh, we can prove that uh, the mean field equilibria MFE of the LQMFG, K star F, F star, is actually the epsilon mean field equilibria of the SLQ MFG. And epsilon is, uh, is in order of trace of sigma C. So something that's interesting is that if sigma C is the covariance matrix of the estimation error, and if, the, if actually the, um, uh, if the estimation error or the covariance matrix goes to zero, then and the, the epsilon will also go to zero. So if the estimation error is small, then uh, this is going to be a very good uh, mean field equilibrium of the uh, secure LQMFG. So moreover, now we, go, we could come back to the finite population uh, game and we, we say that, uh, that the, the, the um, mean field equilibrium of the, of the LQMFG will also be an epsilon plus var epsilon, uh, epsilon plus uh, var epsilon Nash equilibria of the secure N agent LQMFG or LQ game. So, so basically we have obtained uh, an approximate Nash equilibria of the, uh, of the finite population game uh, using the mean field equilibria of the uh, LQMFG. And also these epsilons, so the, the first epsilon is in, is in the order of sigma max, where sigma max is a, uh, is the maximum of, of the trace of the sigma c's, which was the covariance of the estimation errors. So if the estimation errors uh, it goes to zero, then this epsilon quantity will go to zero. And uh, the var epsilon, uh, the second quantity is depends on sigma max and also on the number of agents of the 
a number of agents in the in the game. So if the number of agents uh, actually goes to infinity and the, the estimation error goes to zero, then the um, then this quantity will be very uh, good. It's a very it will be very good Nash equilibrium of the uh, of the finite population game. So so now we have uh, we have uh, analyzed this theoretically. This these uh, uh, this uh, Nash policies uh, theoretically. Uh, now we will have some. We'll do some empirical investigation into the performance sensitivity with respect to uh, some parameters. So first, we take the sampling rate. So um, so performance. Uh, so we measure the performance sensitivity with something called average accumulated cost, which is we can you can think of it as the as the empirical measure of uh, the performance of of the of the game. So, uh, so we generate this uh, this cost for a, for a given uh, number of time steps t, and, and as you can see, that if the number of time steps increases, then the the average cost goes down, and this is due to the stabilizing nature of the uh, Nash equilibrium policies. Uh, something that's uh, more interesting is that as the sampling rate increases, uh, the the average accumulated cost decreases, but it uh, kind of plateaus to uh, to it uh, converges to some fixed point and uh, and uh, so uh, sampling, for higher sampling rates we can expect good performance of the of the nash strategies right okay and then so next we we look at the performance of the of this nash strategies with respect to model parameters or some perturbations in model parameters so let's say that we we add some perturbation what if the a and b parameters have some perturbations then you can see that if the perturbation is large, then the average accumulated cost will be larger, meaning that uh, the, the performance of the strategies will be, uh, will be worse. And that's, uh, that's expected because uh, the, the strategies have been uh, designed for the unperturbed A and B matrices. Finally, we look at the perturbation uh, with performance with respect to perturbation in the private keys. So if the private keys are perturbed, uh, that's something interesting we found is that the performance does not degrade a lot. So uh, the performance actually seems to be very uh, constant and the, the spread is even not very uh, changing a lot. So, so for this gives us uh, some, some, um, some idea about what, what if the adversary finds out this, uh, finds out the private key of the agent, then we can perturb it by a small amount and without any significant Change in the uh, performance of the of the game, and uh, so finally, I'll just conclude the presentation. Uh, we propose this uh, multi-grid sensor output sampling mechanism to reconstruct reconstruct the state. Under this reconstruction, uh, we proposed uh, mean field equilibrium strategies for the SLQMFG. Uh, these strategies were also shown to be epsilon uh, Nash equilibrium strategies for the N secure N agent dynamic game. And uh, finally, we uh, do some empirical uh, empirical performance uh, measurement on these strategies. And uh, I think that's that's time. Uh, thank you. And I'm uh, willing to take any questions. All right. Thanks for the talk. Um, yep. Let's see. Um, any questions? I don't think they're um, for for people who can speak. They um, they you, you, you know please speak up. Um, for those who are not able to speak, um, 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 you can type in your chat box. Okay, let me ask you a question here, just before maybe uh, somebody is, is typing right now. So what is the, uh, um, uh, how you guarantee the security in this case? Um, is there anything that you observed impact of security on the Nash equilibrium or mean field Nash equilibrium? Uh, so security. So uh, since the agent is free to choose from uh, from the set of uh, private keys, and it chooses uniformly, and uh, the, the private key is, is private to the agent, then we assume that the, that uh, it's the information that the communication is secure. So yeah. So we don't really uh, uh, analyze the security uh, per se, but since the agent is free to choose uniformly from the set of private keys. And uh, this private key is only known to the agent itself. Then we assume that the communication is secure. So, so when when you say private keys, um, um, you mean everybody has his own key, and and the uh, the communication is using symmetric um, 
uh, a key infrastructure, or you're talking about a private key and a public key infrastructure? So we have, uh, okay, so private key is probably, so what we do is we, the sensor uh, sketches the state uh, using this linear transformation. And um, the CI matrix is obtained from this. So, so basically all the agents have access to this set of private keys or uh, CI matrices. Basically these are, this is a set of matrices and it just chooses uniformly. So, so because it chooses uniformly, uh, only uh, the agent has access to this. So, so the agent, it's private to the agent and no one else knows about this, uh, knows about this uh, private key. And uh, we assume that, uh, I mean, because it's, uh, the agent chooses privately, the adversary also does not know which key it uh, chooses. So, so, so the, in that sense, we assume that uh, the communication is uh, secure. Is, is your challenge uh, in extending this work to, to continuous time? A continuous time? I don't think so. I think there have been works. Uh, there have been a lot of works in continuous time. So I think I, uh, not, not really challenging, I, I would say. So it's, the, the, it's a straightforward to, to, um, to uh, you know, look at the continuous time counterpart of this, uh, of this result. I would assume so, yeah. Okay. Yes, it's pretty similar, similar analysis, yes. All right, any questions? that we have from the audience. Um, if not, let's thank the speaker. Um, if we can applaud. Uh, applaud. So let's uh, um, thank the speaker and uh, um, hopefully the next speaker is here. I think it's Christos, I'm correct? Yeah, I'm yeah. Are you here? I'm here, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so um, why don't you share your screen? I will right now. So let me. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Christos Mavridis from the University of Maryland. And today I'm gonna be presenting you our work on basically defense against adversarial UAV swarms. But we're gonna approach uh, this problem by focusing on detection of leaders in complex swarm maneuvers. So the motivation behind this work is twofold. For one is a fundamental uh, problem of understanding uh, one of the most fascinating phenomena in nature, and that is uh, how animal flocks and in specific bird flocks coordinate and are able to perform these complex maneuvers that we see in the sky. And the other one is once we get the, the ability to transfer this knowledge to artificial swarms, then we, uh, we expect that there will be application of uh, swarms with malevolent purposes. So uh, we can see here that uh, in 2019, there was a drones attack against the president of the United States, but that was only in a movie. But only one year after uh, we get articles uh, with titles, uh, massive suicide drone swarm launch from a box on a track. So we might be uh, closer to these problems than we thought. So uh, defense mechanisms against uh, this kind of attacks uh, uh, should be important. So let's define uh, our main scope. So the main scope is to defend against adversarial attacks from UAV swarms. And we're gonna approach this problem uh, by first observing the trajectories of the agents. And I'm going to use agents and particles of the swarm interchangeably. So first we, observe, we rely on observations of the position and velocity of the, um, of the agents of the swarm. Uh, that doesn't mean we, uh, so, so the methodology is going to be robust to noisy observations of this, uh, of this information, but we're gonna assume for now that we know them. So then we're going to uh, detect uh, any possible leaders that the swarm may have and the associated followers. And that means that we're going to uh, try and find out something about the structure of the, of the swarm. And after we have this structure, we're going to model this overall network system as a Port Hamiltonian system. And what that means is uh, basically a, an energy-based system of uh, differential equations. And uh, we will use this model to, uh, to formulate a large scale optimization problem, which are, is going to be a learning, learning scheme in order to find uh, the coordination laws of the, of the swarm. So 
we're not going to go one step further and propose the defensive scheme against the adversarial swarm. It's going to be something similar to what uh, Daigo Shishika uh, proposed about uh, multi-agent defense games. Uh, but um, uh, one comment about this methodology is that, it's, uh, that it has broader applicability. So uh, we can find applications in a, in a wide range of uh, fields, including communication networks, uh, sensor networks, uh, cyber physical systems, biological systems, and uh, social networks. So what all these have in common is that fast identification of the leaders or the influence groups, depending on the type of swarm we're investigating, uh, is essential actually for defending uh, against uh, malevolent actions. So we're going one step further. We're, we're going to try and uh, approach these uh, steps. So first is the leader detection step. Now, uh, we're trying to compare trajectories. We observe trajectories and we're trying to find a leader among the, uh, these uh, particles. So uh, we're not going, re going to rely solely on correlation uh, measures, but we're going one step further to, uh, see, uh, to seek for co causation and causality relationships. So we're going to use the definition by Clive Granger uh, who has defined the causal relationship based on two principles. One, is that the cause happens prior to its effect. And the other one is that the cause must have a unique information about the future values of its effect. So if you take these two uh, principles and apply it to two time series or two random processes, then you can come up with a hypothesis test that concludes uh, causality between, uh, or a causal relationship between uh, uh, a time series X and time series Y. So basically what we're doing is we learn a linear or autoregressive system for X and a linear, uh, again, a linear system for X, but with external input from Y. And we statistically compare the, the performance of these two models. So if the latter has statistically better performance than the first, then that means uh, that uh, Y is a causation for X. So we're going to use this uh, definition of causality and of course, this is a causal relationship between two time series or two trajectories, but we have a swarm here. So we're going to approach every pair of the, of the particles and uh, take a majority vote criterion. So in the majority vote criterion, the particle I votes for J to be the leader if the hypothesis test is conclusive here. So if P uh, less than half. So yeah, in practice, of course, we have problems with that. We have uh, too many false positives. So we get rid of this quantization step and go ahead and compare directly the p-values. And by doing so, we don't even need the p-values. We just go ahead and compare the f-hat values with f-hat being a measure of uh, the errors of the two models. So again, we have false positive even with this idea, but we observe that um, for every particle i, if if I see all the votes for every particle particle i, and I have a very uh, high fluctuation between the votes, that is indica indicative of false positive. So we come up with uh, with a new measure f u j, which uh, actually is nothing more than the inverse coefficient of variation of of the f hat uh, measure, and for what what it uh, gives to us is get rid of the false positive because of fluctuation. So overall, we have a majority vote criterion to detect a leader among uh, a set of trajectories of particles. But the question then becomes, how many leaders does the swarm that I observe have? And how do I associate the followers to its leader? So the first thing that comes in mind from an engineering point of view is do clustering and in, in its cluster do the leader detection uh, algorithm that we have proposed here. But clustering has two problems. So one problem is here I want to compare trajectories. So is the Euclidean distance a good measure to compare trajectories? And the second and most difficult uh, problem is I do not know the number of leaders that I'm looking for. So traditional clustering methods came in, spectral quantization won't work. So we need something else. And we're going to with deterministic annealing. So what deterministic annealing is, is actually an annealing optimization uh, algorithm for clustering. 
So instead of minimizing a distortion measure like this, which is uh, the typical thing we do in clustering, we actually subscribe to the Jane's maximum entropy principle. Uh, this principle says uh, that of all the probability distributions that satisfy a given set of constraints, always choose the one that maximizes the entropy. So we have a multi-object multi object optimization problem. We, have, we need to minimize the distortion and maximize the entropy. And to do that, we form this Lagrangian here. And we have a Lagrange multiplier, which we call T. And we solve successively uh, this optimization problem for different values of T. And as you go from high values of T to lower values of T, then you get to see uh, too many similarities between this Lagrange coefficient here and the actual temperature um, variable in uh, actual annealing and chemical processes. So this is how the, uh, this algorithm works. And why is this important for us? So first of all, even, minima even, even uh, minimizing this uh, objective function is not trivial. So we're gonna go with coordinate block optimization. But if you go in this uh, direction, this is standard typical in uh, classroom algorithms. So even if you go in this direction, then the second step is an optimization pro The first step is uh, an optimization that we know how to optimize. It's, it gives the Gibbs, the Gibbs distribution. But the second step is an optimization uh, problem that we need to solve, but it degenerates to actually um, computing this uh, sum here if and only if the distortion measure that you have in your algorithm is, it belongs to the family of Bredman divergences. And that's very important because now we have, uh, we can use Euclidean distance, which is a Bredman divergence, but we can go further uh, to general dissimilarity measures, uh, which are, are not metric, uh, we may not be metrics, such as the unnormalized schoolback Liebler divergence, for example. And now we have um, a measure to, um, uh, to describe and uh, uh, trajectories, right? Differences in trajectories. So that's the first part, but the second part and most important is a bifurcation phenomenon that comes by solving successive optimization problems with different uh, temperature T. Uh, so when we have the temperature, uh, very high temperature, we only get one cluster, one leader, and that is the, um, the average trajectory, for example. But as we lower the temperature and solve the, uh, the other optimization problems, so gradually we get a bifurcation phenomenon. The cardinality of the code book or of the leaders or the leader set increases as needed. So it, it gets something like the picture that, uh, that we saw here. So if you follow a specific uh, schedule for temperature and follow the profile of the number of leaders that you get, you can say that up to a point, this is the number of leaders that you need to have. And, uh, and then they rapidly uh, uh, go up. So you can say that this is overfitting. So this is what we use in order to determine how many leaders should be in the, um, in the swarm that we're observing. And because of the classroom, we know all the followers that are, are associated with a, with a given leader. So now we have some information about the, the actual structure of the, um, of the swarm. So we have to go ahead and uh, actually model uh, the swarm. So there are two widely used models when, when uh, one wants to uh, explain the coordination laws of, uh, of a swarm that usually performs a flocking behavior. So in the computer science community, uh, we can find the Boyd's model. It, can, it originated in 1987 by Reynolds. And this is a simulation algorithm based on three basic rules. So each particle has a neighborhood that uh, can observe. And in each neighborhood, it has to preserve co cohesion, alignment, and separation. These are the three rules that the uh, Boyd, Boyd's model is built upon. So on the other hand, in the, in the controls community, uh, there is a Cooker's May model, which is very widely used. And this is um, due to being a nonlinear system of differential equations. Uh, and again, we have the kind of the same rules of cohesion, alignment, and separation uh, into play, but uh, and in the same form of pairwise potentials here, psi, psi uh, ij. 
So there should be a connection between those two, um, those two models. And actually we have showed that these two models are pretty much equivalent with one uh, very important difference. So when the voids in the orange here has a very strict neighborhood that uh, it observes in the quicker's male model, which is a dynamical system, we have a differentiable approximation of this neighborhood. So in other words, now the right-hand side here becomes differentiable. And this is why we prefer this model for our uh, learning scheme that uh, we will explain in a while. So the only unknown now in the model, because we have the structure from the leaders and now we have a model that uh, models the actual coordination laws, the only unknown for us now is this interaction function psi. So here we show uh, exactly why these two um, should be, uh, these two models should be equivalent. But the more, uh, more importantly, we show that the input, the, um, the cookie smell model can be written or can be viewed as an input st state output for Hamiltonian system. And that means that we have uh, an exogenous input that comes from our leaders and we have a differential, uh, a system of differential equations that is energy based. And our unknown, which is a function, the interaction function in the quicker smell model, now comes uh, as a term in these two matrices. All right, so now we can formulate uh, an optimization uh, scheme uh, in order to find. Uh, the, this unknown function psi, and we're going to model these functions as a, as a single neural network and form this uh, large scale uh, optimization problem. So, in this problem, uh, be, because we have imposed this structure of the Port Hamiltonian system, we can um, plug in the psi function as a neural network. And now the whole right-hand side becomes a function of the weights of the network. And now we can apply the same exact methods that we that we do in large-scale optimization problems. Uh, we're going to do an iterative uh, gradient descent or back propagation uh, with the Adam method. And we're going to use automatic differentiation. All of these uh, techniques are possible here. And we use them. Uh, in a scalable uh, algorithm to solve this optimization uh, problem. So the goal here again is to uh, reconstruct the, the psi function, the interaction uh, function of the, of the model. So once we have that, we have all the nodes that we wanted about, um, about the swarm. So let's go through some experiments. The first experiment on the left is a proof of concept, concept experiment. So we have a quicker smell model with one leader, we simulate it, and then we observe it, we detect the leader, we go, uh, we model it, the, mod, the port Hamilton system, we uh, do the learning algorithm, and we reconstruct the, the particle trajectories and we pretty much can reconstruct the particle trajectories 100%. Uh, 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 so this is a proof of concept, but it shows us that uh, it should work, right? But, but again, we simulated the, um, the data with the same model that we used to learn the data. Now on the right hand side, we use the Boyd's model to simulate the data and the quicker smell model to learn uh, uh, the interaction function. And what happens is that because we use the, uh, the Boyd's model, uh, you, you can see that we have, uh, we get some jerky trajectories here that, that comes because of the rigid uh, neighborhood um, of the Boyd's model. But we, we, we treat these trajectories as noisy observations, for example, of a uh, real life um, uh, swarm. This is in 2D. So we, again, we do the same thing, detect the leader, learn the, the dynamics and the side function, and then reconstruct the trajectories. And what we get is actually a reconstructed trajectory of the particles, but a smoother version of the trajectory. And by smoother, I mean, it's like a, we, it, it's been passed through a low pass filter. And this is very interesting, and this is quite what we hoped to to have, and uh, and actually we 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 actually get it. And lastly, last experiment, um, and I'm on time. Uh, we have to check the, our algorithm with multiple leaders. So now we have two leaders. Um, you, you can see that the trajectories are interlaced in some uh, time windows, but again. 
we we do the we run the deterministic handling uh, algorithms. We correctly find that there are only two leaders, no more, no less. We correctly classify the followers to the to the leaders, and then we uh, do the same thing. Uh, learn the dynamics, the interaction function, and pretty much reconstruct uh, the interaction function. So from here, we can use this information in order to be able to efficiently and, uh, and promptly defend against a swarm that has malevolent uh, purposes by, the, the simplest thing is by uh, attacking the leaders of the swarm. Uh, so with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks for the uh, the talk. Um, let's see, any questions from the audience? Uh, so I had a question. Mm -hmm. uh, just a moment. Okay, so about the uh, uh, Cooker's male uh, model of, uh, of the dynamics. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not very aware of uh, this uh, of this model. But is it? Uh, so it's just a dynamical system. So I had this. Uh, I had this uh, maybe a stupid question. But can it be written down as an optimization or optimal control problem? So basically, uh, we write down some optimal control problem and uh, the optimal policy, uh, the closed loop dynamics under this, that optimal policy comes out to be that uh, Cooker's mail model. Is it possible somehow? Like, is there some so work like if that? I, so let, let's start with uh, the Cooker's mail model is an uh, autonomous model. So you don't have input, right? But what you're saying maybe is if if we're trying to solve some kind of optimization problem, is the solution to that problem the cooker smell model? Is that the question? Right. Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, I would be uh, I would be impressed if there was an objective function that is optimized by the cooker smell model. But the 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 way it was introduced to the community was as a plausible model for the for swarms to communicate in order to have a consensus that means a flocking behavior this is defined in a certain way so this mm -hmm. is how this was uh, this model was defined i don't know if it's a solution to some kind of optimal control problem right, right. because uh, the swarm is essentially is a collection of uh, of agents which are uh, kind of trying to solve their own own op op optimization problem. They're, yeah. they're trying to minimize the cost uh, somehow. So yeah. basically it's a, but this is like the emergent behavior. So maybe do we have some idea of what the optimization problem itself is? Uh, maybe there's some- Yeah, so it solves a problem. The problem is convergence and consensus in the sense that uh, the, you have velocity, velocity alignment in the, in the limit and uh, the, the, you have spatial cohesion. This problem is solved by this model, but I don't know if it is the optimal model to do so. I, I, can, I, can I add something? I doubt if there's going to be an optimization problem for a very simple reason. The behavior of the Cooke's male model is extremely robust to the actual functional form of the, of the potentials. This has been shown. So as, as a result, uh, I, 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 even if there is an optimization problem, I, I doubt it, but even if there is, it's not as useful. Because the important result is that uh, even when these uh, uh, functions vary a lot, right, from the actual form that you assume, the, the, the results of trajectories are the same. This is what one can exploit here to, uh, to understand the behavior right. and, and the defense for that matter, okay? But that's to be done. The other thing that I don't know if you mentioned, Christos, is that because this is a security conference, similar problems appear in social networks over the internet exactly. yep. with multi agents and others. So, where you may, and actually, that the problem is a bit easier because you don't have the, the, the complex kinematics and other dynamics from, from the robots. So, there you try to find out who the leaders are, for instance, who are the bad influencers, and try to stop the propagation. So, there are many similar problems in social networks and other things we're discussing in this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, other questions? So I had one question. Go ahead. Uh, so um, uh, it's a, it was a really interesting talk. So uh, can you comment on whether these things can be used for deception? I mean, uh, if I'm at a swarm of drones that's attacking and there is somebody using some data-driven estimation technique, I mean, how can I use these things to have some deception techniques so that they can cannot figure out who the leader is. Yeah, so, so the first thing in mind is uh, dynamically changing the leaders of the swarm. 
But there's a bottleneck, a communication bottleneck to that because. Uh, what's the What's the movie? What's the movie? An angel, <laughs> an angel. I mean, the best answer that I can give you is, "What's yeah. the movie?" Because there, if you have seen it, you know that this is possible. Uh, it's called okay, okay. An, "An Angel Has Fallen." So indeed, you can actually change the leaders, and therefore make it very difficult for people to defend against. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And when I see movies like this, I, in the back of my mind, I say, if, if it made to the movies, they probably have it already. Okay, so <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. All right, um, other thoughts, questions for the, for the speaker? Okay, um, if not, let's move on. Okay, so now uh, we have the uh, last, but not the least uh, uh, speaker for today. Um, are you here, Sally? Good. So, um, Sally yeah. is from Arizona State University. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. Can you see my screen yes. properly? Okay. All right. So, today I'll be presenting our work on moving target defense for robust monitoring of electric grid transformers in adversarial environments. And uh, this is joint work with uh, Costa Basu. Uh, Aruna Basen and Subarao Kambampati, everybody from Arizona State University. Uh, it's sad that I can't be physically present for the conference. I've been I've been at the conference for the last two years as well. But I guess uh, with the surreal times, this is how we do it. So before I get into uh, the adversarial setting, let me first describe the problem in a non-adversarial case. And uh, I will start off with the setting where uh, an electric grid transformer network or a power network can be converted to a graph uh, or rather a bipartite graph where there are two sets of nodes. So the first, sets of, first set of nodes represent transformers, which are points of interest that you want to monitor in this power network. And the second set of nodes represent uh, locations where you can place power monitoring units. And the edges between these uh, two sets of nodes kind of determine that if you see a particular uh, event in, in one of the transformer networks, actually, let me just uh, switch to a laser pointer. So if you see a particular kind of event in one of the transformers, then that will trigger some form of an event via the edge at one of your uh, sensor placement positions. Now, the, the goal of setting up uh, or, or, or setting up a solution in this case is that you want to uniquely identify when a failure occurs at a transformer such that you know which is the transformer that is uh, causing problems and address that problem. And so uh, in uh, one of the previous works by uh, Basu et al. in 2018, they uh, defined this sort of a conversion from a power grid network to a graph. And then they model this problem as a minimum discriminating code set. So the idea here is, can you find the least number of sensor placement points such that if you do so, uh, each transformer triggers a unique fingerprint. So let's say if this transformer has a pass surge or lands up in a failure, then it triggers an event at these two sensor placement points. And by looking at it, if you see that among these three sensors, these two have been triggered, then you can be sure that transformer one is the one that's failing and address it. So this is the setting for the non-adversarial case where you're trying to uniquely fingerprint your uh, nodes of interest using sensor placement points. Now, obviously this doesn't really work in adversarial settings and uh, we'll consider a threat model where the attacker can attack a single sensor placement point. So let's say, for example, you have this sort of uh, sensor placement for monitoring transformers, and the attacker gets to attack one of the sensor placement points. So in this case, by attacking this point, let's say that it does uh, denial of service or make sure that no signals coming from any of the transformers is visible or triggers this sensor point, then what happens is that uh, data for this sensor is kind of becomes invalid. And once that happens, you no longer have any unique fingerprinting capabilities. For example, if, if uh, only this, uh, which is this sensor is triggered, then you're not sure whether T1 is at fault or T4 is at fault. And so what this causes is, it causes a problem for you to figure out which of these transformers are actually failing. And this is a very small example network that you can 
think about when there are much larger power grids, uh, trying to uniquely fingerprint is a very big requirement. And when this doesn't happen, then uh, you can't actually do it. And so that's the threat model we'll consider. Uh, I also wanted to point out that uh, there has been a surge in the uh, domain of attacks for power networking systems. And henceforth, this sort of a threat model is very plausible in a power network, in a power network setting. So now let's move on to the adversarial setting. And first, let me go top down and describe what is the sort of defense approach that we are going to consider. And then we'll talk about the details of this approach. And so this is uh, related to the security game setting. And I come more from the side of uh, cybersecurity. And uh, we'll call this a moving target defense approach, where you're dynamically shifting between different sensor deployment configurations. And uh, what this gets you is that by dynamically shifting, you're always keeping the attacker guessing as to where the sensors would be placed. And hence, for the threat model, which tries to attack these sensors or prevent, uh, uh, say, sort of uh, jamming attacks or uh, somehow interfere with the signal that these sensors receive uh, isn't as effective as before in expectation. And whenever we are considering a moving target defense setting, uh, there are very two very important questions. One is, what are the strategies of the defender? So what are the configuration, what is the configuration set uh, or the pure strategy set that the defender should move? And the second is, how do we come up with a deployment strategy? Now, given this community, I'm guessing that this part of how to move should not be uh, very difficult to understand that by modeling this as a game theoretic problem, we'll seek for some sort of strategy at equilibrium. But uh, this paper mostly concentrates on what to move. Now, before getting in the what to move, let me give a brief introduction of how this problem can be viewed in a game theoretic model, uh, can be viewed as a game theoretic model. And then let me go into how we can find a defender's PR strategy set, what are the properties required there. So in this game theoretic model, we have two players, an attacker and a defender. And the attacker's threat model can actually uh, take out certain sensors uh, that the defender wants to use. But the defender has a choice to place different sets of sensors, which are indicated by these colors. So for example, the defender can choose to place uh, sensors in all the, say, uh, uh, the pink nodes, for example, before the attacker attack. So all the pink nodes or in all the green nodes uh, or nodes of any particular single color. And the attacker gets to attack one sensor. So if the attacker attacks uh, uh, one of the pink sensors, then we will say that this deployment mechanism, if the, de if the defender was using uh, the deployment mechanism for the pink sensors, then that is kind of invalidated. We'll, we'll get into a little bit more details how this uh, invalidated is defined and how the utility values are computed at a later point in time. But uh, that, that will be how we'll say. Uh, but on the other hand, if the defender chose a different uh, uh, set of sensors to activate for detecting transformer power surges or any sorts of failures in the points of interest, then the defender should be fine because the attacker would not have been able to actually hamper the unique fingerprinting capabilities. And so basically, if you view this as a game, then the defender strategy is the set of uh, sensor placement points that they might choose to deploy. And the attacker's uh, pure strategy set would determine the sensor placement points that they attack. Uh, later, I'll also talk about a little why this is a reasonable threat model for a power network setting. Uh, but now let's move on and see how do we determine a defender's pure strategy set, which is what to move or, or what are the uh, pure strategies between which the defender can switch. And so we would like to ensure some sort of uh, desirable properties. Uh, the very first one is that each of the individual PR strategies should be able to uniquely fingerprint uh, the transformer networks, uh, sorry, the transformers. And second, we want this to be as small as possible so that at any particular time, you have to deploy the minimum number of sensors. And uh, the second is, uh, the, the second major property that we want to ensure is that no pair of pure strategies should actually have an overlapping sensor. Because if that is the case, well, you could have overlapping sensors, but in that case, the attacker would be able to attack a single sensor and uh, impact 
multiple configurations. So we want these two properties to be there. Obviously you can relax some properties and I will talk about that uh, as I go through the presentation. And we, we want to guarantee these two uh, properties for the different SPO strategy set. So in this work, what we do is we define a problem based on the minimum discriminating code set problem. So the minimum discriminating code set problem is can you determine a single set of sensors where if you place uh, where if you place these sensors, each of these transformers is uniquely fingerprinted and all of the transformers have to have a fingerprint. And so we define a problem known as the K differentially immune MDCS. And what this trial is to say is that we don't want to find a single uh, minimum discriminating code set, but we want to find K of them such that two properties are ensured. First, each of the solution sets uh, is a minimum discriminating code set of the graph. And the second is that between any possible pairs, there is no overlap, right? And so that's the uh, uh, problem that we propose in the paper in trying to determine the defender's PR strategy set. And we show in the paper that this problem for any value of K greater than zero is an NP complete problem. And uh, a very uh, easy way to at least not be surprised that this is uh, at least that hard is the fact that if you put k equal to one, then you're basically looking at the minimum discriminating code set problem, which is known to be NP complete. Now, uh, uh, generalization that we can do from here is that for any graph theoretic solution problems, when you are looking for solutions which are say differentially immune or diverse, then you can show that all of these problems, which uh, have this notion of minimum identifying code set, minimum set cover, minimum vertex cover, and you transform them into a K differentially immune minimum identifying code set, uh, K differentially immune minimum set cover, all of these problems are at least going to be NP hard. Uh, but again, I won't go into the details here. So now the question is having defined the problem, how are we going to compute the different or, or the K MDCS solutions that the defender can use uh, as its pure strategies. And so in this case, we define a quadratically constrained um, ILP problem. And uh, this problem is defined uh, using the variables X, S, K. So think about the case where instead of a single graph, you replicate and make K copies of the graph. And the value of X, S, K says that you are going to place a sensor on node S in the graph K if this value is equal to one. And uh, if its value is equal to zero, then you're not going to place a sensor in node S of K. And we are now going to ensure that the two properties, desirable properties that we talked about hold in this uh, optimization problem. So the first set of property says is that uh, for each graph, the solution that you find, so, so these are for each K, and this has to be hold true for all the graphs. So for any solution that you find for a single graph, it has to be a minimum discriminating code set, right? So, so this, these two constraints together ensure the minimum discriminating code set, and these set of properties ensure that it is a discriminating code set, which guarantees a unique fingerprinting. Uh, the second set of properties that we try to ensure is that, uh, among no pair of these graphs, and it's and it's sufficient to show that if you do this for the pair, then it would hold for the entire set. But again, those proofs are there in the paper. I won't go into the details. And this kind of tries to show that between any two pairs of graphs, uh, the discriminating, the minimum discriminating code sets that you have selected for these two graphs should have no overlap in the sensor placement points that you select. Uh, this, this constraint can also be eased down to a linear one using some uh, optimization techniques, but we just go with a quadratic constraint because the solvers allow us to solve it. So uh, now having said that, you will be able to find K uh, pure strategies for the defender. And an interesting question that comes is, how do you find the uh, largest pure strategy set for the defender? that guarantees the properties of differential immunity and all of the uh, solution sets are minimum discriminating code sets. And so to find that we use an iterative approach where we iteratively solve uh, the optimization problem here 
by increasing the value of k. And uh, we stop when one of the two conditions are ensured. Either the optimization problem becomes infeasible or the solutions generated by the optimization uh, problem generates minimum discriminate or generates discriminating code sets that are not necessarily the minimum discriminating code sets. You can obviously find a minimum discriminating code sets as you're increasing the value of K from one to uh, higher values. And so once you encounter or hit one of these conditions, you know you have found the max K value for finding the, the differentially immune MDCS. And there's a proof in the paper which shows that this should work. Now, as you might have already guessed, this computation can actually be time consuming because you're solving quadratically constrained uh, MILPs multiple times in this iteration. And so there are ways to approximate the solution to this uh, problem. And uh, I wanted to point out that there are three kinds of approximations that you can do for this problem. So the first is you can relax the K value where you say that I don't need the K max, I just want a, a sufficient number of strategies where if I uh, activate sensors between, I'm fine with that. The second is you can relax the notion of differential immunity, which says that no two sets can even have a common vertex overlap. So what you can say here is I'm fine with pure strategies where any pair of pure strategies has say one vertex overlap instead of no vertex overlap, or, or you could choose a more suitable definition, but which relaxes this no, uh, no uh, the subset is null basically. And the third approximation that you could do is you could go for discriminating code sets, which are not necessarily the smallest in size. And all of these three approximations would imply certain kind of assumptions in the power network system. So if you're going for a lower value of K, then the number of sensors that need to be initially placed by the defender, but not activated, uh, will decrease. If you go for uh, non-differentially immune, then that number would decrease. And if you go for a discriminating code set, which are not necessarily minimum, then that number would again increase. And, uh, and again, we, did, we don't have uh, case studies with power networks here, although this problem is motivated and formulated with Dr. Arun and Gustav who have worked on power network systems. Uh, and so, so we don't really go for all the three kinds of approximation or do field studies for the short paper. But what we do is we consider a particular heuristic method to do this sort of approximation, which relaxes the K value. Uh, so now having set up the game theoretic model, how you compute the defender strategies, let me talk briefly about how are you going to come up with a mixed strategy over these set of pure strategies that you found uh, for this problem. Uh, and this should be like preaching to the choir for the game set community because uh, this is this is what they most of you specialize in. And so basically here we do a utility value calculation. So first let me talk about that. So let's say that uh, uh, the defender plays a pure strategy which uses the blue node sensors, right? And the attacker attacks one of the blue node sensors, which is this one. And so if the defender has played uh, for example, let's first consider the defender plays uh, the sensor active or activates the sensors in the pink nodes, then the defender can still uniquely identify uh, each of the transformer failures and henceforth they get the full utility for that. On the, on the other hand, the attacker has to spend some cost because in these physical domains, each of these power monitoring uh, units are placed in say some sorts of stations that are physically uh, distant from one another and also requires different kinds of uh, cost. For example, say some of these might be uh, uh, based on social engineering. Some of these might be based on social engineering plus cyber attacks and stuff like these. Some of these could also be uh, using a huge jammer outside one of the stations to disable the sensor signals and stuff like those. And so these have related cost for even attacking a single point uh, in the sensor network. And hence part, the, the threat model where the attacker gets to attack one of the sensor point is very reasonable in this domain. And so the attacker incurs a cost for doing that attack. On the other hand, if the defender played a pure strategy that could be affected by this attack, 
then the defender only gets utility for uniquely fingerprinting T3 because all of these can be uniquely fingerprinted and the attacker gets some utility for being able to disable the unique fingerprinting for uh, the remaining uh, transformers and also incurs the cost of doing this attack. Now, uh, something I wanted to point out, but again, since this is not a real world deployment we haven't looked at is that the utility for uh, monitoring these transformers could be varied. For example, you could have a transformer supplying power to the White House versus a transformer supplying power to say uh, a rural village with, with very less number of uh, houses. And henceforth, you might have very different utilities for uh, identifying failure in a transformer, uh, providing power to the White House versus the rural village where there are very less or few inhabitants. And so, so those things can be factored into the utility model, but again, we don't have the realistic values to talk to them in and see how it works out. Uh, the second thing is, I'll just go over this briefly because as I said, it's like preaching to the choir. Uh, we consider this as a stackable game where the attacker uh, knows what are the possible strategies for the defender and based uh, uh, your strategies and also what is the mixed strategy that they're going to play. And based on that selects uh, the particular sensor node that they're going to attack. And so a strong Stackelberg equilibria works out to be a good movement strategy in this setting. Now, uh, I'll discuss some experimental results, uh, which are mostly based off of the MATPAR IEEE test cases. And uh, we, we uh, so, so these are the, so we use the corresponding graphs for each of these test cases. And uh, first, uh, let me talk a little about the strategy set size of the different players. And uh, the, the K here indicates uh, the value of, uh, or the number of pure strategies for the defender if we use the uh, approximate greedy heuristic for approximating the k value. And this is the k max that you could guarantee by using the optimization problem we showed. Now for, for all of these cases, we see that uh, the initial uh, optimization problem we proposed uh, returns solutions within reasonable time, which is I think less than uh, three minutes. We, we will get to the time in just a minute. And so, Basically, as you will see that the value of K is less than the value of K max, which is sort of the optimal solution, but oftentimes the greedy solution is also able to find the approximate value. So, so it's, it's a decent uh, greedy heuristic solution, but we don't have, again, approximation proofs to say what it would be bounded within. Uh, the second part is uh, what are the, how many places can the attacker attack in? And so although say, for example, the graph might have a large number of nodes, we give the attacker the advantage that they might know where are the sensor placement points. That's kind of the uh, assumption of the Stackelberg setting. And henceforth, the attacker would only try to attack the places where the defender might have placed uh, a sensor monitoring unit or a power monitoring unit. Now with that, uh, we compare two strategies. One is the strong Stackelberg equilibrium strategy, and the other is the uniform random strategy, because in these domains, there is ideally no baseline, which is also sort of true for many of the uh, physical or cyber domains that people have looked at uh, in security games, because uh, there is no reasonable baseline and people have always been deploying uh, based on some heuristic guidance or knowledge, domain knowledge that they inherently have in their head. And uh, hence, in, in this case, since people even haven't thought of the adversarial intent in these sort of networks, so we use the uniform random strategy as a baseline. Now, obviously, we know that uh, the strong Stackelberg equilibria will be the optimal solution uh, given our game theoretic formulation, and hence URS at best can be equivalent to it. But uh, in, in all the test cases, we see that it's not uh, even as good as the SSE for any of the cases, and hence for using any sort of these kind of heuristic deployment strategies such as URS wouldn't yield any benefit. Uh, benefits and probably you could do much better by using SSE. And uh, for the SSE, we note one interesting fact is that initially we, we thought that uh, if you had a larger number of defense strategies, uh, then that would probably help the defender in getting a high utility. Now, obviously, all of you can see that that thought might be flawed uh, due to a set of reasons, the sort of utility value structures of the game. Uh, and but, but we observe that for even the 
uh, non-optimal number of pure strategies where where the defender strategies is not as high as the K-max case. Uh, the rewards are similar and in some cases better. So that was the observation we had. Uh, we then also went in to see that what is the time taken by uh, the the optimal, which is the optimal quadratically constrained MILP versus the greedy heuristic approach that uh, relaxes the uh, number of pure strategies that the defender gets. And in this case, we, again, this is a, a, a log scale and hence part. This is almost around 400 seconds, I believe 300 or 400 seconds. And this is around 0 0.01 uh, seconds. Uh, so, so we see that as the number of uh, nodes in the graph formulated from the IEEE power networks increase by a lot, uh, the time difference increases. And we see this increase attributed to two things. One is when you have a larger number of uh, uh, K sets compared to a lower number of K sets, which is obvious. And the second thing is when the size of each minimum discriminating code set is uh, uh, pretty high, in those cases, even a single getting a single extra solution to increase the defender's PR strategy set uh, has a huge increase in the time. So with that, I'll just give a few takeaways. So, so in this paper, what we do is we consider this problem of uh, sensor placement for unique fingerprinting in power networks in the presence of adversarial intent. We formulate this as a game theoretic problem. And then we consider moving target defense solution for this game. Uh, we, we mostly focus on how to use the existing graph theoretic models that are used to determine the sensor placement points uh, to come up with the pure strategies for the defender. And finally, we use a, a strong Stackelberg equilibrium solution or a strategy at strong Stackelberg equilibrium in this game to find the optimal movement strategy for the defender. And with that, I'll conclude uh, thank you all for listening in, and I will take, happily take your questions. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, any questions that uh, we want to ask here? No. Okay, I think I think there are um, um, no questions from the chat. Any questions from the audience? Okay. So um, I think it's already two o'clock. So I think we are finishing on time. So thanks for speaker. And, uh, and also, um, I think this is exciting session of a cyber physical system. We have seen so many different types of a cyber physical system here. So uh, maybe John, you have a last remark before we closing today. I want to thank everybody and the speakers in particular and the chairs. Everything went very nicely and I hope I can see you tomorrow. We'll have an exciting day tomorrow with some invited talks. And also don't forget the all important industry panel. And we have four extremely good people from industry to, uh, to come tomorrow afternoon. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, oh, everybody. and we will have the announcement of the best paper tomorrow. Yeah, yeah thank, thanks a lot. Uh and uh, let's see each other tomorrow. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.